Uh, we believe 100% that he was on board. And Falcon was really in the garage this whole time. Uh, I don't know if Falcon can hear me, but was he, because uh, I know at some point he fell asleep in that garage, but he was hiding out because he thought you were going to punish him for something that happened earlier in the day. Uh, did he hear anything? Did he hear you screaming out, Falcon, Falcon? Uh, he's, he's asking Falcon, did you hear us calling your name at any time? Mm -hmm. You did? You did? Well, why didn't you come out? Um... You guys said that um, we did this for the show. Man. No. You didn't um, come out? No. Um, I, I heard what he said, but I'm sure not, I'm not, it wasn't really, really clear. What was his, his reasoning why he heard, he heard you screaming, Falcon, Falcon, and I'm sure his, he heard his mom screaming, Falcon, Falcon, but why didn't he come out of the garage at that point? Well, you know, whenever he, um, whenever we tell him things like, you know, it's a bad thing to do, he does go and hide. He uh, cowls down. And... Um, like if we go to the store and uh, he wants to buy some candy or something, I have to tell him no. So he's always behind. I mean, the other boys are always telling him, hurry, Falcon, hurry. So he does, um, he does tend to do that. So dejected at the end. I mean, it's like, oh, I didn't even think about this one more lie I have to tell. <laughs> Welcome to the Literary Hangover. I'm your host, Matt Leck. With me once again, Alex Guns. Hello. Uh, today, we're talking about uh, hoaxes and balloons and a lot of different sort of things. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall, or as it was known in 1835 when it was uh, published, uh, Hans Fall, A Tale. Um, that was the balloon boy hoax where uh, the Henny family was trying to basically Won the hearts of America. <laughs> land a reality show deal had a balloon that looked like a flying saucer and they're like well let's let's do a hoax where we say our kid accidentally is flying away in there and it turned out that wolf blitzer sort of i guess scooby dooed them accidentally somehow like he he asked the kid the question the it was like the just, edward r murrow moment of our time just where, cut right through the bullshit with where that interview wolf blitzer's like i heard what you said yeah. <laughs> I think he was I'm almost like confused. He had like enough secondhand embarrassment to be like, "I'm I'm willing to give you an out on this because this is so humiliating." Yeah, exactly. So uh, that is the most recent, at least in, in terms, uh, in, at least in as far as I know, the most recent balloon hoax. But uh, there was a couple in 1844. Poe wrote a story called the balloon hoax. Actually, uh, Alex has read that. I've not. Mm -hmm. um, but even before that, there was the unparalleled adventures of one Hans fall, which we're going to talk about today. We want to start and put it in relation to another famous moon hoax, which is known as the uh, great moon hoax. Hans fall. Uh, the story appeared in the uh, June 1835 issue of the Southern literary messenger. When Poe was in Richmond, Virginia, um, Poe was later hired as a staff writer. The Great Moon Hoax, which we're going to find out about here from this YouTube page I like, I discovered and <clears throat> does a good summary of it, happened in August. So Poe's story comes out in June, and The Great Moon Hoax happened in August. Here is a YouTube page called The Folklorist, uh, which I don't know if they're still putting out videos, but this is from October 17th, 2013. Uh, and this, I think, does a pretty good job of summarizing the Great Moon Hoax. In 1835, the American newspaper industry was booming and faced heavy competition. In an effort to boost circulation, a two-year-old paper called the New York Sun lowered its price to one cent, beginning the era of the penny press and making newspapers affordable to everyone. But the paper would have to turn to more sensational and attention-grabbing stories to meet the demands of their new audience. On August 25th, the first installment of six articles under the headline Great Astronomical Discoveries appeared on the front page of the New York Sun. The series went into lengthy detail, outlining evidence of life on the moon. But there was just one problem. 
none of it was true. The articles were authored by Sun journalist Richard Locke, who was writing under the alias of Dr. Andrew Grant. He cited the Edinburgh Journal of Science as the source of the story, crediting Sir John Herschel, a respected and well-known astronomer, for these great discoveries. The story claimed that Herschel had made some amazing scientific discoveries on the moon by means of an immense telescope. The massive telescope had the ability to view in great clarity even the smallest forms of life due to its second lens, the hydro-oxygen microscope, which allowed for further magnification. I like that uh, innovation, the, uh, what was it, the... The hydro-oxygen microscope. Yeah, like you, you always need a new uh, innovation to sort of drive further imaginative possibilities. That's sort of the sci-fi or science fiction like um, vehicle, basically. Yeah, I feel like the mark of a good hoax is when something seems like fishy to focus in on it as the writer to be like, no, it isn't. Look, it has this long name. Yeah, and also I want to point out um, how this moon hoax identifies itself as a reprint from the Edinburgh Journal of Science. So the New York Sun was just reprinting something that was already in another journal. And that sort of reprint culture is very... Uh, I, I want people to think about this in the context of the of the internet, how that sort of revolutionized uh, information. Yeah. Like, I think they were going through a similar sort of thing here. And I actually think Hans Fall is less a story about science fiction and more a story about that uh, in, uh a type of information and how like mass culture and mass information uh, affects people uh, affects society even the smallest forms of life due to its second lens the hydro oxygen microscope which allowed for further magnification unicorns two-legged beavers and bat-like winged men roamed the lunar surface which was covered in forests beaches and even sapphire temples after the story was printed, the paper's circulation rose to nearly 20,000, the largest in the world. But not everyone <laughs> caught the fever. Rival editor of the New York Herald, James Bennett, was suspicious. As soon as he started raising questions about the existence of this great telescope, the final installment of the story was published, which claimed that it was destroyed after Herschel left it pointed at the sun. That's clumsy. Yeah, I mean, that sucks. <laughs> Don't. Like lunch arrives and he goes, one second, and just pushes the telescope towards the sun. He's like, no, the, no. This is the one thing we didn't want to happen. That's why I love like it selling out so many copies, just like coming home from, you know, working in a mill or like on like a farm all day, like living hell life and be like reading the paper and be like, you hear this? Like they got like a uh, winged gentleman on the moon. That's, that's We're going to buy two copies of this. Actually, that's crazy. I mean... It would be fucking nuts, right? Mm -hmm. That would be so fun to live in that moment. Yeah, yeah. Especially the early ones where it's like, okay, this because a new telescope in Cape Town, South Africa. Yeah, it's like, well, we can't check on that. And it's just funny, like the Herschel, the scientist, they cite, uh, like it would be very magical. Like think, like that's the that's the Higgs boson. That's the like the cutting edge of like what we know. Yeah, about our place in the universe. And all of a sudden, he, this mist in in South Africa, you know, the British Empire, right? Uh, you have a giant new telescope that can see the moon. And holy shit, guys, there actually is a whole bunch of stuff on there, including yeah. Batman. Yeah, or is it that's a beaver that walks on its hind its hind legs? That's much less impressive. Yeah, but it's like imagine like I would assume in the way it's written, it's like that's the first thing you're like that's. That's fucking crazy. Yeah, I mean, and they also men with bat, bat men with bat wings. Yeah. And be like, what? I mean, not only are they one upping our beavers, <laughs> yeah, so these are presumably much more powerful beavers. Living in that moment would be very interesting mm -hmm. to like go down. I need to go get the new edition because there's more on this giant telescope that's looking farther than hum humanity's ever looked before. Aimed that it was destroyed after Herschel left it pointed at the sun. In addition, Bennett uncovered that the article source, the Edinburgh Journal of Science, had ceased publication two years earlier. Mm -hmm. Then, Bennett attempted to unveil the true identity of the author, the mysterious Dr. Grant. He used editorials in the Herald that refuted the lunar story and put pressure on Richard Locke to admit penning this felonious forgery. Soon news of the grand discoveries of life on the moon spread to Europe, catching the attention of the then very real and respected Sir John Herschel. 
At first amused, Herschel soon became annoyed at the false claims made by the paper. He denied his involvement with the New York Sun, as well as the existence of the enormous telescope. After several weeks, the Sun eventually admitted to the hoax, but never issued a retraction. It was only <laughs> after yeah. Richard Locke had left the paper that he finally laid claim to the Great Moon Hoax. The six articles published by the New York Sun in 1835 successfully grabbed the public's attention. It's remembered as one of the greatest media hoaxes in history that brought about a new age of ethics in journalism. Citing sources and fact-checking would become mandatory in news reporting, setting a higher standard of credibility and separating the line between fact and fiction. So yeah, well done, folklorist. That was a pleasant little video. Um, Apologizing and not retracting it is uh, is like the when like a journalist obviously misleads with like a quote and then apologizes but will not delete the tweet. Yeah, it's like the classic, uh, or that's like the new version of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Getting trying to get places to issue retractions. I remember I did a little bit of that when I was a fact checker in uh, in London. Like they don't give a fuck. Like they really oh, like, yeah. un, like unless unless the public's gonna get really pissed enough for them for it to be a headache for them, they mm-hmm. do not care. So Locke, the uh the the author of the moon hoax there, actually was Poe's editor later when Poe himself went to work for the Sun, and that was where he wrote the uh, balloon hoax in eighteen forty four, which is a similar sort of hoax, you know, let's try to sell uh newspapers and it, it worked to some extent then too. But Poe's reaction immediately upon the release of this uh, Great Moon Hoax stuff in the Sun was one of jealousy. He wrote to John P. Kennedy, a Whig politician and novelist, in September, uh, on the 11th of September. I know. I, I saw that and I was just like, oh, wow. 1835. A hoax on 9 11? That's impossible. Uh, <laughs> man, what was Poe trying to tell us? <laughs> Um, we know he has some story about like uh, he wrote like a short story that's identical to the titanic but like years before it happened oh really he knew the guy is q and on he's yeah he's q and on um uh so poe's writing this is a month after or so after the uh the great moon hoax in the sun uh, he ran into john p kennedy have you seen the discoveries in the moon do you not think it altogether suggested by hans fall it is very singular but when i first per- but when i first purposed writing a tale concerning the moon the idea of telescopic discoveries suggested itself to me but i afterwards abandoned it i had however spoken of it freely and from many little incidents and apparently trivial remarks in those discoveries i am convinced that the idea was stolen from me that feeling didn't last especially because he as i said he later went to work with Locke. this is from mj dinius poe's moonshot hans fall and the art and science of antebellum print culture in poe studies uh, dark romanticism uh to, from 2004 quote uh, writing about the great moon hoax in a biographical sketch of its author 11 years later Poe surprisingly asserts we are indebted to the genius of mr Locke for one of the most important steps yet taken in the pathway of human progress while we might expect Poe to credit Locke with this significant accomplishment due to the unprecedented public interest in astronomy that his hoax inspired his praise is motivated instead by Locke's significant advancement uh, of American journalism, even if by deception, uh, Poe explains, quote, from the epoch of the hoax, the sun shone with unmitigated splendor. The start thus given the paper ensured it a triumph. It has now a daily circulation of not far from 50,000 copies and is therefore probably the most really influential journal of its kind in the world. Its success firmly established the penny system throughout the country. I was curious. I feel like you would know. So did without we'll get when we get to the ending. We'll get to the ending. But did Poe intend for this to be a series or to continue it on to like a novel? Because the ending is abrupt. Yeah, he suggests he did. He's later in some letters, but it's unclear if that's true or not, or if it's. Hmm. He he says that the Great Moon Hoax coming out when it did after uh, weeks after his story made writing his second part redundant right yeah um but there's some suggest there's some uh some writers or uh, critics have said that that might just be he 
Like, I think he might mention that even in the notes to Hans Fall, but that is probably not true. Uh, yeah. It was probably meant as a one-off thing. Because the ending is abrupt, but I do think it works, or it's like a really strong ending of a short story, I think, actually. Yeah, and I think when you when you view it through the sort of lens of what the symbolism means, especially mm-hmm. if it is a comment on the Penny Press... I think it, it's a very interesting story. By the way, if you want to experience it without us demystifying it with this stuff, um, you should do that before, because we are going to play the entire thing here. I want to quote a little bit from I think my favorite of the uh, uh, articles I read on this in preparation. This is um, by uh, Carlo Martinez, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Hans Fall, The Penny Press, and The Autonomy of the Literary Field in the Edgar Allan Poe Review uh 2011 ballooning ascensions exploration narratives and travelogues scientific discoveries the mounting importance of technology social turmoil and the crisis of the artisan class the birth of the penny press a redefinition of the literary terrain and the emergence of mass readership all these interconnected phenomena were at the core of u.s cultural life during the 1830s and they all figure significantly in hans fall an early tale poe published in the 1835 june issue of the southern literary messenger martinez goes on uh, I shall argue much of the incongruity ascribed to Hans Fall seems to dissolve as soon as one begins to read the tale as a critical commentary on the rise of the penny press and as a parody not so much of ballooning as of the New York Sun, the first successful U.S. penny newspaper, which had begun publication in 1833, only two years before Hans Fall appeared. And then he quotes a little bit from Hans Fall, but we'll get to that later. Uh, but of the uh, balloon made of dirty newspapers. Um And then Martinez continues. Far from being incidental to the tale, Poe's relation to the penny press lies at the heart of it, for its central image, that of a balloon made of dirty newspapers, can be seen as a metaphor for the New York Sun. Poe's later well-known statement, that the Sun constituted, quote, one of the most important steps yet taken in the pathway of human progress, clearly registers his perception of how the apparition of his newspaper ignited a revolution in the social and cultural landscape of antebellum America, the effects of which rippled out much further than the journalistic field. As far as I can tell so far on this podcast, this is the first uh, truly blue-collar writer that we've come across, right? Right. I think that shows in the prose that we'll get into, but it's a lot less precious than anything else that we've read. The, the prose itself, it jumps into different styles and different forms. And it's, in, in my opinion, especially for an early work, a very strong piece of prose, but nonetheless is he's willing to just kind of fuck around <laughs> in mm. a way that has a free and loose quality to it that um, let's say Hawthorne definitely uh, did not have. Yeah. You know, he, I think he's a little bit like Washington Irving, Oh, okay. Uh, that's the only comparison I can make. Like with the with the names of the characters that we come up yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Like, like the Von Underduke or whatever. Um, yeah. That's supposed <laughs> to be really funny. Yeah, exactly. Making fun of uh, a, a, a European aristocracy. Yeah, go ahead. Make make fun of a German man's name. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and that is, I think that is the main distinguishing difference between Poe and the other writers is unlike Irving and fenimore cooper and and hawthorne uh, and sedgwick he has to worry about money an awful lot yeah uh and i don't have his biography down as much as i will in later episodes when we talk more on poe but uh, poverty was a huge concern with him throughout this it was it was difficult unlike you know hawthorne just getting a government job um <laughs> Yeah, there's like a speed to the the prose, like a rapidity of like line after line. It's like it's it's very conscious and wanting to keep you engaged. Poe was very conscious of, conscious of this uh, style of writing becoming more and more the um, the demand by the 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 sort of um, American public on the go sort mm-hmm. of thing. They were already already anxious about. Oh, people don't have enough time to really sit down and read something that long. So, like these penny, this penny press thing, where you could fold it up and take it with you, and you have uh, scientific discoveries on the same page as fiction. Mm-hmm. It was like the internet, basically. Like, there's so much, and you're pulling like articles from wherever. It's not clear the the um, 
uh, intellectual property issues are, you know, they're American did not honor copyright for British authors a very long time. Um, which is, you know, I mean, does Charles Dickens really need that third butter churn? That's no. what, that's what China's asking about Bill Gates. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So let's, uh, let's begin with this. We're going to go with the, um, we're going to go with the LibriVox crew. Uh, they, the three different people do the reading. Uh, they do a good job. I mean, there's a good, uh, I have a, a good b- version on audible too, but, I don't think Audible would like it if I play it in its entirety from them. So we're, and I also like, um, to, I can't believe a company that's owned by Jeff Bezos yeah. would be that litigious. Yeah, exactly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandy Gunther. The Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall. By late accounts from Rotterdam, that city seems to be in a high state of philosophical excitement. Indeed, phenomenon have there occurred of a nature so completely unexpected, so entirely novel, so utterly at variance with preconceived opinions, as to leave no doubt on my mind that long ere this, all Europe is in an uproar. Okay, so not to... Uh, pause too quickly into it. We'll try to let it run a little bit. But uh, I first want to point out that Poe, especially early on in his career, basically only ever wrote about European or sort of vaguely European settings. It was, yeah, extremely vague settings and extremely vague time period. Yeah. And he, he was conscious about that. He thought like that allowed more room for imagination, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, while we're paused, I don't know if your edition, but in mine, there's a quotation at the beginning. Oh, go on. It's a, it's just a quotation from Tom O'Bedlam's song, which is a 17th century poem about this, like almost like folk character called Tom O'Bedlam, which is, I guess, in the 1600s and before it was uh, commonplace to to feign mental illness, like as a beggar, and that was called like you were called like a bedlam because you were from. I think it's is it Bethel Hospital or something like that was a okay yeah yeah a there was a, Ill, yeah um, yeah and it was so, it was in popular culture to the level that uh, King Lear and in Shakespeare's King Lear famously plays like the Bedlam character uh, and I think that that's kind of like a key for understanding where Poe is coming from this quotation which is um, with a heart of furious fancies whereof I am commander with a burning spear and a horse of air to the wilderness I wander. Mm, and the wilderness, I guess, in this, um, is that, like I said, I want, let's not spoil anything too yeah. much. Um, I want to, uh, uh, cite something that I've sort of brought up a few times. This is from Jorg Lukacs. Uh, I, I looked Nailed up the pronunciation it. of that. It's tough though. It's Georgie, Georgie yeah. Lukacs, not to be confused with George Lucas. <laughs> Jorg Lukacs is a Marxist writer. Uh, in this, he wrote the historical novel in 1955. And uh, the way that the uh, Poe talks about all of Europe being in a turmoil, it reminded me of this part that I I, I think about a lot from this, um, where he talks, well, I'll just quote this from page 23. This is available on uh, online if you just search the historical novel PDF. A lot of Marxist writers, you can just do that. But um, uh, so here, here's this uh, quote. It was the French Revolution, the Revolutionary Wars, and the rise and fall of Napoleon, which for the first time made history a mass experience and bore over on a European scale. During the decades between 1789 and 1814, each nation of Europe underwent more upheavals than they had previously experienced in centuries, and the quick succession of these upheavals gives them a qualitatively distinct character. It makes their historical character far more visible than would be the case in isolated individual instances. The masses no longer have the impression of a natural occurrence. One need only read over Heine's reminiscences of his youth in Buch-le-Grand, uh, to quote just one example, where it is vividly shown how the rapid change of governments affected Heine as a boy. Now, if experiences such as this are linked with the knowledge that similar upheavals are taking place all over the world, one must enormously strengthen the feeling first that there is such a thing as history, that it is an uninterrupted process of changes, and finally that it has a direct effect upon the life of every individual. And then he goes on to talk about how, like, basically needing mass armies necessitated uh, 
propagandizing mass populations. And uh, I think that sort of feeds into where we end up with uh, Hans Fall uh, here. Mm-hmm. Counts from Rotterdam, That City, Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 1. The Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall. By late accounts from Rotterdam, that city seems to be in a high state of philosophical excitement. Indeed, phenomenon have there occurred of a nature so completely unexpected, so entirely novel, so utterly at variance with preconceived opinions, as to leave no doubt on my mind that long ere this, all Europe is in an uproar, all physics in a ferment, all reason and astronomy together by the ears." It appears that on the blank day of blank, I am not positive about the date, a vast crowd of people, for purposes not specifically mentioned, were assembled in the great square of the exchange in the well-conditioned city of Rotterdam. The day was warm, unusually so for the season. There was hardly a breath of air stirring, and the multitude were in no bad humor at being now and then besprinkled with friendly showers of momentary duration that fell from large white masses of cloud, which checkered in a fitful manner the blue vault of the firmament. Nevertheless, about noon, a slight but remarkable agitation became apparent in the assembly. The clattering of ten thousand tongues succeeded, and in an instant afterward, ten thousand faces were upturned toward the heavens. Ten thousand pipes descended simultaneously from the corners of ten thousand mouths, and a shout, which could be compared to nothing but the roaring of Niagara, resounded long, loudly, and furiously through all the environs of Rotterdam. The origin of this hubbub soon became sufficiently evident. From behind the huge bulk of one of those sharply defined masses of cloud already mentioned was seen slowly to emerge into an open area of blue space, a queer, heterogeneous, but apparently solid substance, so oddly shaped, so whimsically put together as not to be in any manner comprehended, and never to be sufficiently admired by the host of sturdy burghers who stood open-mouthed below. What could it be? In the name of all the vrows and devils in Rotterdam, what could it possibly portend? No one knew. No one could imagine. No one... Not even the Burgermaster Meinheer Superbus von Underduck had the slightest clue by which to unravel the mystery. So, as nothing more reasonable could be done, every one to a man replaced his pipe carefully in the corner of his mouth, and cocking up his right eye towards the phenomenon, puffed, paused, waddled about, and grunted significantly, then waddled back, grunted, paused, and finally puffed again. I mean, if you were reading this as a news story, you'd be like, just get to it, God! And it's just like detailing. As a story, I like it because you you get the little character of like what these townspeople are to do. But talk about burying the lead on this one. (laughs) Carlo Martinez in his uh, Hans Fall, The Penny Press, and Autonomy of the Literary Field, their reaction to this giant uh, thing coming out of the sky is, Poe is comparing that to reaction to news hitting a public Mm. um so let's see here the uniform reaction of the public moreover suggests how quickly poe had gained an understanding of the manipulative power of the medium while the definition of the crowd as an assembly at once resonates with the authoritative overtones of a legislative body and prefigures the grim image of the standardized mechanized movements of an assembly line Class differences, then, are key to the understanding of Poe's story. The reading public of this new journalism is itself portrayed as a mass-manufactured product, a public not made of free liberal individuals who actively participate in the cultural field, but of passive consumers, who have very limited agency in the commodifying process that makes news circulate. The inarticulate grunts and puffs of the pipes replace critical inquiry and enlightened public debate in what appears as a parody of the public sphere, a crowd standing open mouth. I mean, now that's the comment section, right? Instead of just huffing and puffing and, and you know, puffing on their pipe and just grunting, people tweet or comment on YouTube, which is, I think, an improvement that we have that sort you of... You think so? I think so, definitely. It makes it much more democratic. I guess yeah, that's true. The idea of the times or Times Square, God, the the idea of uh, the town square being refurbished to online has like its benefits, but it being like a 
the town square being a corporate power is kind of unnerving and unfortunate. You mean being like uh, like newspapers or like Twitter, right? Yeah, it would definitely. Yeah, um, same as same as it ever was, I guess. Um. In the meantime, however, lower and still lower toward the goodly city came the object of so much curiosity and the cause of so much smoke. In a very few minutes, it arrived near enough to be accurately discerned. It appeared to be, yes, it was undoubtedly a species of balloon, but surely no such balloon had ever been seen in Rotterdam before. For who, let me ask, ever heard of a balloon manufactured entirely of dirty newspapers? No man in Holland, certainly. So, yeah, it's not a stretch to say this is meant to be viewed symbolically. Oh, yeah. As a, as a tale, as a, as a satire or allegory of the press, basically. This, this floating ball of hot air made of newspapers. Of newspapers, yeah. And um, the dirty newspapers thing is actually a, a class um, uh, thing, too, a class signifier. Newspapers that aren't shared by as many hands are more elite newspapers like a a lord i'm just gonna have my newspaper i'm gonna read it and might share it with my family or something oh that's interesting but like a penny press right like you're gonna buy one of those you can pass it around a right. whole lot and they're gonna get a, like a lot uh i mean just as books do you you can tell when another person has had it basically yeah i know when he when he released that notes on han's fall like a kind of a way of like covering his ass of like it was obvious it was a satire the whole time Right. It points to stuff like that being like, look, how, like you know what I'm trying to do. Like only an idiot would take this seriously. Well, he's talking specifically of the balloon or of the great moon hoax, not of Hans Fall in the notes. Oh, that's I, I made that same mistake, too. Um, I read the notes as talking about Hans Fall, but he's talking about why you shouldn't have been fooled by the great moon hoax. Oh, he's like, if you fell for mine, like, that's, that's reasonable. Yeah, because a big part of it is, like, well, he's like, mine wasn't really meant to be taken. Right, yeah. But I did do a lot of scientific verisimilitude in the balloon takeoff. But he says, like, yeah, there's no way you could have a mirror that big yeah, to yeah. see the moon, you idiots. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, James Gordon Bennett, uh, owner and editor of the Herald, established in 1835, uh, soon became the sun's most aggressive competitor, uh, stigmatized the sun as, quote, as a quote, dirty, sneaking, driveling, contemporary. I don't want to say it. I'm not, I don't know, N word paper. Right. And first of all, I don't think it was literally meant by, or read, I mean, maybe some black people read it, um, but yeah. it's, if a guy like Edgar Allan Poe's writing for it, like it's not aimed towards black people. I mean, you just have to read some of Edgar Allan Poe's other works. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can see that he's, Poe is not writing for a black audience, or at least not consciously so. But that, like, that, that class disdain for, you know, a, a paper that, I mean, at this point, you still have in America, right? Like, if you t- teach a slave to read, in big parts of the country, that's like... It's a crime. That's a huge crime. Um, so... I don't even think that... Oh, wait, never mind. I was going to say, I don't even think that slavery is illegal in New York, but I think it's newly illegal. In a, I think 1827 yeah. is the year I... I I'll, so less than 10 years, basically. Uh, in 1799, New York passed a Gradual Emancipation Act that freed uh, slave children born after July 4th, 1799. July 4th, that's a nice Cute. way to... Uh, but indentured them until they were young adults. In 1817, a new law passed that would free slaves born before 1799, but not until 1827. So, I mean, there's probably, I don't know. It, it, it hangs That's such on. A, like, that is such a, like, Obamacare way of getting rid of slavery. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Damn before. For who, let me ask, ever heard of a balloon manufactured entirely of dirty newspapers? No man in Holland, certainly, yet here, under the very noses of the people, or rather at some distance above their noses, was the identical thing in question, and composed, I have it on the best authority, of the precise material which no one had ever before known to be used for a similar purpose. It was an egregious insult to the good sense of the burghers of Rotterdam. As to the shape of the phenomenon, it was even still more reprehensible being little or nothing better than a huge fool's cap turned upside down. 
Like and this similitude was regarded as by no means lessened when, upon nearer inspection, there was perceived a large tassel depending from its apex, and around the upper rim or base of the cone, a circle of little instruments resembling sheep bells, which kept up a continual tinkling to the tune of Betty Martin. But still worse, suspended by blue ribbons to the end of this fantastic machine, there hung, by way of car, an enormous drab beaver hat, with a brim superlatively broad, and a hemispherical crown with a black band and a silver buckle. It is, however, somewhat remarkable that many citizens of Rotterdam swore to having seen the same hat repeatedly before, and indeed the whole assembly seemed to regard it with eyes of familiarity. While the Frau Gretel Fall, upon sight of it, uttered an exclamation of joyful surprise and declared it to be the identical hat of her good man himself. Now, this was a circumstance the more to be observed, as Fall, with three companions, had actually disappeared from Rotterdam about five years before in a very sudden and unaccountable manner, and up to the date of this narrative, all attempts had failed of obtaining any intelligence concerning them whatsoever. To be sure, some bones, which were thought to be human, mixed up with a quantity of odd-looking rubbish, had been lately discovered in a retired situation to the east of Rotterdam, and some people went so far as to imagine that in this spot a foul murder had been committed, and that the sufferers were in all probability Hans Fall and his associates. But to return, the balloon, for such no doubt it was, had now descended to within a hundred feet of the earth. allowing the crowd below a sufficiently distinct view of the person of its occupant. This was, in truth, a very droll little somebody. This is like the first uh, little green man, or maybe not the first. There's probably others, but... like That's this. like the first I can think of. It's crazy how close it is to what we think of now. Yeah, like there's a bizarre little figure. That, that you're going to hear how they describe him, and I can't really even picture him in my head. It's so bizarre. He's a very yeah. squat, round little thing. Here it is. Eat of the earth. allowing the crowd below a sufficiently distinct view of the person of its occupant. This was, in truth, a very droll little somebody. He could not have been more than two feet in height. But this altitude, five, little five, as it was... Two feet is really small. That's like very I, tiny. I feel like the little green men are like three and a half or something. Yeah. Like a two feet tall is like on his shoulder, pretty much. <laughs> its occupant. This was, in truth, a very droll little somebody. He could not have been more than two feet in height. But this altitude, little as it was, would have been sufficient to destroy his equilibrium and tilt him over the edge of his tiny car, but for the intervention of a circular rim reaching as high as the breast and rigged on to the cords of the balloon. The body of the little man was more than proportionately broad, giving to his entire figure a rotundity highly absurd. His feet, of course, could not be seen at all, although a horny substance of a suspicious nature was occasionally protruded through a rent in the bottom of the car, yeah. or to speak more properly, in the top of the hat. His hands were enormously large, his hair was extremely gray and collected in a queue behind. His nose was prodigiously long, crooked and inflammatory. His <laughs> eyes full, brilliant and acute. His chin and cheeks, although wrinkled with age, were broad, grotesque. puffy, oh, and yeah. double. Like faces. But ears of any kind or character, century. there was not a semblance to be discovered upon any portion of his head. This odd little gentleman was dressed in a loose surtout of sky-blue satin, with tight breeches to match, fastened with silver buckles at the knees. His vest was of some bright yellow material, a white taffety cap was set jauntily on one side of his head, and to complete his equipment, a blood-red silk handkerchief enveloped his throat and fell down in a dainty manner upon his bosom, in a fantastic bow-knot of super-eminent dimensions. Having descended, as I said before, to about one hundred feet from the surface of the earth, the little old gentleman was suddenly seized with a fit of trepidation, and appeared disinclined to make any nearer approach to terra firma. Throwing out, therefore, a quantity of sand from a canvas bag, which he lifted with great difficulty, he became stationary in an instant. He then proceeded, in a hurried and agitated manner, to extract from a side pocket in his surtout a large Morocco pocket-book. This he poised suspiciously in his hand, then eyed it with an air of extreme surprise, and was evidently astonished at its weight. He at length opened it, and drawing therefrom a huge letter sealed with red sealing-wax and tied carefully with red tape, 
let it fall precisely at the feet of the burgomaster, Superbus von Underduck. His Excellency stooped to take it up. But the aeronaut, still greatly discomposed, and having apparently no farther business to detain him in Rotterdam, began at this moment to make busy preparations for departure. Before we get to that, I still don't entirely know what this is. So this is like some sort of messenger, maybe? I mean, maybe we'll figure it out more. Maybe. Go ahead. Like some courier that's delivering this letter. It's clearly not Hans Fall. Yeah. It's clearly not human or of this earth, possibly. Yeah. Although that's not clear. Like, he could have, like, maybe that is Hans Fall after his, like, bizarre transit. Yeah, or it's some sort of weird disguise. Uh, yeah. Uh, if this is, like, in the story, if it ends up being a hoax. But it's it's very bizarre, and I'm not sure exactly how to read the... He was surprised by the letter and that sort of stuff. I like how the scene is played out without dialogue. Mm-hmm. That no one being, you know, being approached by this uh, interstellar... Um, balloon is speaking and this creature is not speaking and because they don't know how to uh, presumably you're the reader are with them in that moment like well i don't even know what to say and so it is it works well these actions are happening that don't have a don't have a, a reason a known reason behind it yeah and but they can be understood as a sort of take me to your leader sort of thing. yeah yeah like they're going to uh the burgomaster superbus von underduke and yeah. his excellency yeah um, I can't help but feel that, and this this will kind of go through. But this this starts very similarly to me, like a, as a like a recap of uh, Rip Van Winkle mm-hmm. and the this idea of like someone falls asleep and they're gone for a or they're they're gone for a long time and they return and the, the Rip Van Winkle one is like how crazy it would be if your wife died and yeah. you'd be free. And this one starts that way and it, it is in familiar territory, like familiar like Americana territory. And I like how Poe strips that feeling away by making it much more concrete, saying things like the balloon was 100 feet above the earth, Mm -hmm. like away from terra firma. Like this is becoming like a detailed account of something happening rather than a story about, rather than like this story of magic where you meet the ghost of the half moon. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get into this when we talk about it as uh, early science fiction, but a lot of the previous sort of moon stories didn't focus so much on the voyage and focused on getting there and then comparing the moon society with earth society. Mm-hmm. No farther business to detain him in Rotterdam began at this moment to make busy preparations for departure and it being necessary to discharge a portion of ballast to enable him to reascend the half dozen bags, which he threw out one after another without taking the trouble to empty their contents tumbled every one of them most unfortunately, upon the back of the burgomaster, and rolled him over and over no less than 120 times in the face of every man in Rotterdam. It is not to be supposed, however, that the great underduck suffered this impertinence on the part of the little old man to pass off with impunity. It is said, on the contrary, that during each and every one of his one and twenty circumvolutions he emitted no less than one and twenty distinct and furious whiffs from his pipe, to which he held fast the whole time with all his might, and to which he intends holding fast until the day of his death. In the meantime... That's interesting how, like, so this message, whatever it is, it, the... It really upsets the social order. Like, literally, the top of the food chain gets embarrassed in front of everybody Yeah, uh, in receiving it. His pipe, to which he held fast the whole time with all his might, and to which he intends holding fast until the day of his death. In the meantime, the balloon arose like a lark, and soaring far away above the city, at length drifted quietly behind a cloud similar to that from which it had so oddly emerged and was thus lost forever to the wondering eyes of the good citizens of Rotterdam. All attention was now directed to the letter, the descent of which, and the consequences attending thereupon, had proved so fatally subversive of both person and personal dignity to Mm -hmm. His Excellency, the illustrious Burgomaster, Mynheer Superbus von Underduck. Get him. That functionary, however, had not failed during his circumgyratory movements to bestow a thought upon the important subject of securing the packet in question, which was seen upon inspection to have fallen into the most proper hands, being actually addressed to himself and Professor Rubadub in their official capacities of President and Vice President of the Rotterdam College of Astronomy. It was accordingly opened by those dignitaries upon the spot, 
and found to contain the following extraordinary and indeed very serious communications. I just want to uh, highlight that we have a Professor Rubadub, uh, the vice president, who is the vice president of Rotterdam College of Astronomy, meaning Superbus von Underduke is the president, which is, that's a very common thing in Europe, especially like the, the, the princes and the aristocracy has positions on these royal societies, mm. sort of scientific uh, things. When we talk about Mason and Dixon someday, um, that's going to be a huge part of this is like the sort of um, the, the monarchy and sort of royal society and empire basically being a part of uh, scientific uh, inspection and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. To their excellencies, Von Underduck and Rubadub, President and Vice President of the States College of Astronomers in the city of Rotterdam. Your excellencies may perhaps be able to remember a humble artisan by name Hans Fall and by occupation a mender of bellows who, with three others, disappeared from Rotterdam about five years ago. In- bellows are the sort of fan like uh, device that you use to squirt air uh, or uh, uh, whoosh air into fires to sort of fan them. And this, uh, read this as a sort of basically t- says that newspapers came around and they. Uh, could fan the fires with those and put them out of business. So this is a lot about um, the uh, mass production um, coming of like sort of mass society and like also capitalism displacing the artisan uh, system. And he'll, he it gets pr- fairly explicitly into that. That's what sort of leads, leads him to take this moon voyage. I think also that society is in a state of decay, like mm-hmm. delusional decay for this hero uh, Hans Fall, which like that's a an, an, a very strong archetype that is with us even today in American literature. This like scientist who is driven by two things: one to discover truth, and driven out of society because he's like they're getting in the way of his genius. Some right. people, some people even internalize that to the like Steve Jobs <laughs> to the point where they don't go to a real doctor. Yeah, yeah, but it is interesting because he isn't even he doesn't want to be a scientist. It's interesting how he be- sort of becomes one because he's yeah. there's just he's now he's just this guy who it's a very specialized trade, right? Yeah, like you mend bellows. It's a guy who's sick of the bullshit. <laughs> yeah. In a manner which must have been considered by all parties at once sudden and extremely unaccountable. If, however, it so please your excellencies, I, the writer of this communication, considered by fall, and by occupation a mender of bellows, who, with three others, disappeared from Rotterdam about five years ago, in a manner which must have been considered by all parties at once sudden and extremely unaccountable. If, however, it so please your excellencies, I, the writer of this communication, am the identical Hans Fall himself. It is well known to most of my fellow citizens that for the period of 40 years I continued to occupy the little square brick building at the head of the alley called Sauerkraut, in which I resided at the time of my disappearance. My ancestors have also resided therein time out of mind, they as well as myself steadily following the respectable and indeed lucrative profession of mending of bellows. For to speak the truth until of late, that the heads of all the people have been set agog with politics— No better business than my own could an honest citizen of Rotterdam either desire or deserve. Credit was good, employment was never wanting, and on all hands there was no lack of either money or goodwill. But, as I was saying, we soon began to feel the effects of liberty and long speeches and radicalism and all that sort of thing. People who were formerly the very best customers in the world had now not a moment of time to think of us at all. They had, so they said, as much as they could do to read about the revolutions and keep up with the march of intellect and the spirit of the age. If a fire wanted fanning, it could readily be fanned with a newspaper, and as the government grew weaker, I have no doubt that leather and iron acquired durability and proportion, for in a very short time there was not a pair of bellows in all Rotterdam that ever stood in need of a stitch or required the assistance of a hammer. This was a... So the way he describes basically a coming of newspaper culture with weakening govern- governments is very interesting in light of, you know, current basically Facebook and Google destroying democracy. Yeah, that's true. Um, but he seems to not have, he's tying it all together, right? Like it's not just the coming of 
newspapers. It's the whole idea of like liberal democracy. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a joke. I, I can't tell if yeah, it's a it's an actual send up on liberty, or I think it's more the idea that liberty could ev- would ever be granted to the average person to begin with. I think it's what uh, Hans Fall is taking. Uh, he has a, a bone to pick with that. It's ludicrous that you're all being controlled. You just have no idea how, which is what, and this will, well, there'll be like the through line for the story, but Poe is like a definitely in that line of romantic writers of like, you need to get away from society. Cause that is like a greater form of control than anything that we ever saw in like the feudal right. medieval era. Like Rousseau, I guess. Mm-hmm. At time, there was not a pair of bellows in all Rotterdam that ever stood in need of a stitch or required oh, wait, the sorry, assistance of a hammer. I got to say, like, I know he's like idealizing it, but the idea that a bellow repairman is an incredibly lucrative job <laughs> seems surprising. Yeah, to things me. must have been very good. In the- not the guy who makes the bellows, the guy who fixes the bellows. Yeah, he's rich. That's like a VCR repairman. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, how many times is that going to break? I guess a lot if you're using it a lot. I don't know. If you're really fanning. This was a state of things not to be endured. I soon grew as poor as a rat. And having a wife and children to provide for, my burdens at length became intolerable. And I spent hour after hour in reflecting upon the most convenient method of putting an end to my life. Mm. Duns, in the meantime, left me little leisure for contemplation. My house was literally besieged from morning till night, so that I began to rave and foam and fret like a caged tiger against the bars of his enclosure. There were three fellows in particular who worried me beyond endurance, keeping watch continually about my door and threatening me with the law. Upon these three, I internally vowed the bitterest revenge, if ever I should be so happy as to get them within my clutches. And I believe nothing in the world but the pleasure of this anticipation prevented me from putting my plan of suicide into immediate execution by blowing my brains out with a (laughs) blunderbuss. I thought it best, however, to dissemble my wrath and to treat them with promises and fair words until, by some good turn of fate, an opportunity of vengeance should be afforded me. Love that. One day, mm-hmm. having given my creditors the slip and feeling more than usually dejected, I continued for a long time to wander about the most obscure streets without object whatever, until at length I chanced to stumble against the corner of a bookseller's stall. Seeing a chair close at hand for the use of customers, I threw myself doggedly into it, and hardly knowing why, opened the pages of the first volume which came within my reach. It proved to be a small pamphlet treatise on speculative astronomy, written either by Professor Enke of Berlin or by a Frenchman of somewhat similar name. So again, print culture is sort of driving this change. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's sort of passive. He's not even really seeking anything out. It's just what's available to him and is going to have a huge impact on where he goes from here. It's quite the stirring image of alienation that... Marx and others would describe of once you go into this like capitalist mode of production and society that he the you you're the the society is like saying you're free and you know touting freedom personal because you have know, personal choice you can pick all these newspapers basically but he's going insane with debt like mm, yeah and to the point where he's he's lost all meaning or purpose in life he's literally wandering down the streets alienated from from his his role in society as a craftsman, thus like his entire identity has unraveled before him. And it's, he fantasizes about a murder suicide (laughs) with him and his creditors. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And then he's just, yeah, just anything I'll be, I'll passively and take any information and let it sort of set the way. Yeah. Like on the way to kill himself, he's like, I'll just read that. I don't don't care. I'll go into a bookshop. Fuck it. I had some little tincture of information on matters of this nature and soon became more and more absorbed in the contents of the book, reading it actually through twice before I woke to a recollection of what was passing around me. By this time it began to grow dark, and I directed my steps toward home, but the treatise had made an indelible impression on my mind, and as I sauntered along the dusky streets, I revolved carefully over in my memory the wild and sometimes unintelligible reasonings of the writer. There are some particular passages which affected my imagination in a powerful and extraordinary manner. The longer I meditated upon these, the more intense grew the interest which had been excited within me. 
the limited nature of my education in general, and more especially my ignorance on subjects connected with natural philosophy, so far from rendering me diffident of my own ability to comprehend what I had read, or inducing me to mistrust the many vague notions which had arisen in consequence, merely served as a farther stimulus to imagination, and I was vain enough, or perhaps reasonable enough, to doubt whether those crude ideas which, arising in ill-regulated minds, have all the appearance, may not often in effect possess all the force, the reality, and other inherent properties of instinct or intuition. Whether to proceed a step farther, profundity itself might not, in matters of a purely speculative nature, be detected as a legitimate source of falsity and error. In other words, I believed, and still do believe, that truth is frequently of its own essence superficial, and that in many cases... The depth lies more in the abysses where we seek her than in the actual situations wherein she may be found. Nature herself seemed to afford me corroboration of these ideas. In the contemplation of the heavenly bodies, it struck me forcibly that I could not distinguish a star with nearly as much precision when I gazed on it with earnest, direct, and undeviating attention as when I suffered my eye only to glance in its vicinity alone. I was not, of course, at that time aware that this apparent paradox was occasioned by the center of the visual area being less susceptible of feeble impressions of light than the exterior portions of the retina. This knowledge, and some of another kind, came afterwards in the course of an eventful five years, during which I have dropped the prejudices of my former humble situation in life, and forgotten the bellows mender in far different occupations. But at the epoch of which I speak, the analogy which a casual observation of a star offered to the conclusions I had already drawn struck me with the force of positive confirmation, and I then finally made up my mind to the course which I afterwards pursued. It was late when I reached home, and I went immediately to bed. My mind, however, was too much occupied to sleep, and I lay the whole night buried in meditation." Arising early in the morning and contriving again to escape the vigilance of my creditors, I repaired eagerly to the bookseller's stall and laid out what little ready money I possessed in the purchase of some volumes of mechanics and practical astronomy. Having arrived at home safely with these, I devoted every spare moment to their perusal and soon made such proficiency in studies of this nature as I thought sufficient for the execution of my plan." In the intervals of this period, I made every endeavor to conciliate the three creditors who had given me so much annoyance. In this I finally succeeded, partly by selling enough of my household furniture to satisfy a moiety of their claim, and partly by a promise of paying the balance upon completion of a little project which I told them I had in view, and for assistance in which I solicited their services. That's awesome. I mean, he couldn't have given them too much detail, right? Or they'd be like, no. So I've got a project. Yeah, I'll pay you back once I get this project off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> By these means, for they were ignorant men, I have a little project which I told them I had in view, and for assistance in which I solicited their services. By these means, for they were ignorant men, I found little difficulty in gaining them over to my purpose. <laughs> Matters being thus arranged, I contrived by the aid of my wife, and with the greatest secrecy and caution, to dispose of what property I had remaining, and to borrow... He's very respectful about his wife, says she can handle herself, and, like, actually thought he was the fuck up a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting that he, you can see these, like, the, the romantic hero, you know, the way of, like, finding truth is looking deeply inward, but... Poe doesn't leave the material reality behind. I feel like a lesser writer would be like, and then he discovered a new self, you know, and he he was determined to go to the the moon, but the story kind of pulls back again, and it's like, well, he, there are practical concerns about leaving the Earth <laughs> that must be accounted for. I feel like his wife would get along well with uh, Rip Van Winkle's wife. You think so? Yeah, we'll see. Her. I don't think anyone would get along with her. <laughs> in small sums under various pretenses and without paying any attention to my future means of repayment no inconsiderable quantity of ready money with the means thus accruing i proceeded to procure at intervals cambric muslin very fine in pieces of twelve yards each twine a lot of the varnish of caoutchouc a large and deep basket of wicker work made to order 
and several other articles necessary in the construction and equipment of a balloon of extraordinary dimensions. This I directed my wife to make up as soon as possible, and gave her all requisite information as to the particular method of proceeding. In the meantime, we'll still use a wife as a domestic, you know, servant, basically. Yeah, but to the level, I mean, this is a whole new level of like make a make a space balloon. <laughs> That Sew this true. together. <laughs> this I directed my wife to make up as soon as possible, and gave her all requisite information as to the particular method of proceeding. In the meantime, I worked up the twine into a network of sufficient dimensions, rigged it with a hoop and the necessary cords, bought a quadrant, a compass, a spyglass, a common barometer with some important modifications, and two astronomical instruments not so generally known. I then took opportunities of conveying by night to a retired situation east of Rotterdam five iron-bound casks to contain about fifty gallons each and one of a larger size, six tinned ware tubes three inches in diameter, properly shaped and ten feet in length, a quantity of a particular metallic substance or semi-metal which I shall not name, and a dozen demijohns of a very common acid. The gas to be formed from these latter materials is a gas never yet generated by any other person than myself, or at least never applied to any similar purpose. The secret I would make no difficulty in disclosing, but that it of right belongs to a citizen of Nans in France, by whom I was conditionally communicated to myself. The same individual submitted to me, without being at all aware of my intentions, a method of constructing balloons from the membrane of a certain animal, through which substance any escape of gas was nearly an impossibility. This is very enlightenment sort of science uh, wankery. In the, the, I feel like it's hinted at, but the the idea of like the Republic of Letters is kind of hidden, not necessarily hidden, but not known group of intelligent people passing letters between each other. That they're like the real masters of the world. Right. That kind of thing. You can see that kind of influx there. I found it, however, altogether too expensive and was not sure, upon the whole, whether cambric muslin with a coating of gum caoutchouc was not equally as good. I mention this circumstance because I think it probable that hereafter the individual in question may attempt a balloon ascension with the novel gas and material I have spoken of. And I do not wish to deprive him of the honor of a very singular invention. So proprietariness. On the spot which I intended each of the smaller casks to occupy respectively during the inflation of the balloon, I privately dug a hole two feet deep, the holes forming in this manner a circle twenty-five feet in diameter. In the center of this circle, being the station designed for the large cask, I also dug a hole three feet in depth. In each of the five smaller holes, I deposited a canister containing fifty pounds, and in the larger one, a keg holding one hundred fifty pounds of cannon powder.、Mm. These, the keg and canisters, I connected in a proper manner with covered trains, and having let into one of the canisters the end of about four feet of slow match, I covered up the hole and placed the cask over it, leaving the other end of the match protruding about an inch and barely visible beyond the cask. I then filled up the remaining holes and placed the barrels over them in their destined situation. Besides the articles above enumerated, I conveyed to the depot and there secreted one of M. Grimm's improvements upon the apparatus for condensation of the atmospheric air. I found this machine, however, to require considerable alteration before it could be adapted to the purposes to which I intended making it applicable. But with severe labor and unremitting perseverance, I at length met with entire success in all my preparations. My balloon was soon completed. It would contain more than forty thousand cubic feet of gas. Thanks, wife. Would take me up easily, I calculated, with all my implements, and if I managed rightly, with one hundred seventy-five pounds of ballast into the bargain. It had received three coats of varnish, and I found the cambric muslin to answer all the purposes of silk itself. Quite as strong and a good deal less expensive. Everything being now ready, I exacted from my wife an oath of secrecy in relation to all my actions from the day of my first visit to the bookseller's stall.、Oh, I love that. And promising on my part to return as soon as circumstances would permit, I gave her what little money I had left and bade her farewell. Indeed, I had no fear on her account. She was what people call a notable woman, and could manage matters in the world without my assistance. I believe, to tell the truth, she always looked upon me as an idle boy, 
a mere make-weight, good for nothing but building castles in the air, and was rather glad to get rid of me. It was a dark <laughs> night when I bade her second. goodbye, and taking with me... I love that, like, the paragraph opens with, he's like, like, all right, wife, like, we've been working, you've been working, I bet you want to know what you're going to work on. Do not tell anyone what you've been working on. And I, I'm going to come back as soon as I can. And he gave her like, you know, like probably three cents on the way out. And it's like, wow, what a dick. But then you find out it's like, she's like, oh, this, I'm going to be quiet because this might be my chance for him to be gone. Yeah, basically. exactly. Like maybe not an awful human being, but not maybe like she wouldn't lose any sleep if he left. So yeah. I, I really like that reversal in the story of like, she's not saying anything because she doesn't care. Like, yeah. And I'm, like, not, I'm not sure how it was in Rotterdam, but I mean, women could often hold property uh, after yeah. their husbands left. Like, I mean, maybe he didn't, I guess he's getting into it. He doesn't have much to, left and he's kind of sinking it all in. <laughs> Hopefully the creditors don't come after her after he sinks all this money into yeah. a balloon. But, but gone for no specific amount of time is my favorite. Like, I, I, I don't know when I'm going to come back. Probably at some point. (laughs) Good for nothing but building castles in the air, and was rather glad to get rid of me. It was a dark night when I bade her goodbye, and taking with me, as aides de camp, the three creditors who had given me so much trouble, we carried the balloon with the car and accoutrements by a roundabout way to the station where the other articles were deposited. We there found them all unmolested, and I proceeded immediately to business. It was the first of April. The night, as I said before, was dark. There was not a star to be seen, and a drizzling April rain 1st. falling at intervals yeah, rendered us very uncomfortable. April first did exist at least in I know I uh, Poe references it in like a letter I think or something like that. Yeah. So April first is a thing at least at this time. It's a little Easter egg for everyone. The night, as I said before, was dark. There was not a star to be seen, and a drizzling rain falling at intervals rendered us very uncomfortable. But my chief anxiety was concerning the balloon, which, in spite of the varnish with which it was defended, began to grow rather heavy with the moisture. The powder also was liable to damage. I therefore kept my three duns working with great diligence, pounding... The three duns are his creditors that he's planning to kill. Yeah. So, like, it's raining out here. Please make sure everything... It goes well tomorrow for a like special plan. He dissuaded himself from just outright killing them <laughs> to like, I'll wait until I can get back at them in a legal way. <laughs> began to grow rather heavy with the moisture. The powder also was liable to damage. I therefore kept my three duns working with great diligence, pounding down ice around the central cask and stirring the acid in the others. They did not cease, however, importuning me with questions as to what I intended to do with all this apparatus, and expressed much dissatisfaction at the terrible labor I made them undergo. Can you imagine that? They could not perceive, so they said, what good was likely to result from their getting wet to the skin, merely to take part in such horrible incantations. I began to get uneasy and worked away with all my might, for I verily believed the idiots supposed that I had entered into a compact with the devil, and that, in short, what I was now doing was nothing better than it should be. I was therefore in great fear of their leaving me altogether. I contrived, however, to pacify them by promises of payment of all scores in full, as soon as I could bring the present business to a termination." To these speeches they gave, of course, their own interpretation, fancying, no doubt, that at all events I should come into possession of vast quantities of ready money, and provided I paid them all I owed, and a trifle more in consideration of their services, I dare say they cared very little what became of either my soul or my carcass. Yeah, well, you're being a con man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I I dissuaded them by promising I would pay later. It's like, like, oh, genius. Yes, they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the money. Yeah, yeah. Like, they don't care about you, buddy. But I like, I do, there is an interesting social pivot here where he's talking about he's going on this great trip with the the idea that he'll be coming back with riches. And I feel like that's very much an age of an exploration concept that we're going to go to the new world where it's happens to be made of gold. Yeah. Just cause yeah, you shouldn't have assumed that this exploration is going to be like that. So what I like about that is it's, it's moving away from that idea of, of, exploration for material gain and that's that very much is like what space exploration is going to be because there just really isn't those precious stones out there and so you have to the the 
Hans Fall character is like, I'm doing it to understand myself. I'm, I'm doing it to like better humanity. He's making this pivot away from material gain into like a spiritual gain, which I feel like we're still kind of in and stuck with. Yeah, maybe, maybe he's making that pivot. I don't know. Maybe, we'll I don't know. In about four hours and a half, I found the balloon sufficiently inflated. I attached the car, therefore, and put all my implements in it, not forgetting the condensing apparatus, a copious supply of water, and a large quantity of provisions, such as pemmican, in which much nutriment is contained in comparatively little bulk. I also secured in the car a pair of pigeons and a cat. It was now nearly daybreak, and and I thought it high time to take my departure. Dropping a lighted cigar on the ground, as if by accident, I took the opportunity, (laughs) in stooping to pick it up, of igniting privately the piece of slow match, whose end, as I said before, protruded a very little beyond the lower rim of one of the smaller casks. This maneuver was totally unperceived on the part of the three duns, and jumping into the car, I immediately cut the single cord which held me to the earth, and was pleased to find that I shot upward, (laughs) carrying with all ease 175 pounds of leaden ballast, and able to have carried up as many more. Scarcely, however, had I attained the height of fifty yards, when roaring and rumbling up after me in the most horrible and tumultuous manner came so dense a hurricane of fire and smoke and sulfur and legs and arms and gravel <laughs> and burning... Legs and arms. So, yeah, he he killed the creditors. He yeah, blew yeah, them yeah. up on the launch pad, yeah. basically. Uh, let me just get your money here. Oh, drop my Ten, cigar. Nine, eight, and they're like, should we be here right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ultras Manor came so dense a hurricane of fire and smoke and sulfur and legs and arms and gravel and burning wood and blazing metal that my very heart sunk within me and I fell down in the bottom of the car trembling with unmitigated terror. Indeed, I now perceived that I had entirely overdone the business (laughs) and that the main consequences of the shock were yet to be experienced. Triple murder. (laughs) Accordingly, in less than a second, I felt all the blood in my body rushing to my temples, and immediately thereupon a concussion, which I shall never forget, burst abruptly through the night and seemed to rip the very firmament asunder. When I afterward had time for reflection, I did not fail to attribute the extreme violence of the explosion, as regarded myself, to its proper cause, my situation directly above it, and in the line of its greatest power. But at the time, I thought only of preserving my life. The balloon at first collapsed, then furiously expanded, then whirled round and round with horrible velocity, and finally, reeling and staggering like a drunken man, hurled me with great force over the rim of the car, and left me dangling at a terrific height with my head downward and my face outwards by a piece of slender cord about three feet in length, which hung accidentally through a crevice near the bottom of the wickerwork, and in which, as I fell, my left foot became providentially entangled. It is impossible, utterly impossible, to form any adequate idea of the horror of my situation. I gasped convulsively for breaths, a shutter resembling I like this genre of writing when you're talking about you know really extreme events when the writer's like I can't even tell you. Yeah. It's like when a par- like when you talk about like certain things and a parent's like I can't even think about that yeah. with their own kid. <laughs> you, you you should have been there, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's probably one of the worst tropes to do if you're writing fiction, which yeah. is to say you should have been there. It was so Epic. sublime and horrifying <laughs> that it can't be put into words yeah luckily there's 20 some more pages of this <laughs> a fit of the ague agitated every nerve and muscle of my frame i felt my eyes starting from their sockets a horrible nausea overwhelmed me and at length i fainted away how long i remained in this state it is impossible to say It must, however, have been no inconsiderable time, for when I partially recovered the sense of existence, I found the day breaking, the balloon at a prodigious height over a wilderness of ocean, and not a trace of land to be discovered far and wide within the limits of the vast horizon. My sensations, however, upon thus recovering, were by no means so rife with agony as might have been anticipated. (laughs) Indeed, there was much of incipient madness in the calm survey which I began to take of my situation. I drew up to my eyes each of my hands one after the other, 
and wondered what occurrence could have given rise to the swelling of the veins and the horrible blackness of the fingernails. I afterward carefully examined my head, shaking it repeatedly and feeling it with minute attention, until I succeeded in satisfying myself that it was not, as I had more than half suspected, larger than my balloon. Then, in a knowing manner, I felt in both my breeches pockets, and missing therefrom a set of tablets and a toothpick case, endeavored to account for their disappearance, and not being able to do so, felt inexpressibly chagrined. It now occurred to me that I suffered great uneasiness in the joint of my left ankle, and a dim consciousness of my situation began to glimmer through my mind. But strange to say, I was neither astonished nor horror stricken. If I felt any emotion at all, It was a kind of chuckling satisfaction at the cleverness I was about to display in extricating myself from this dilemma, and I never, for a moment, looked upon my ultimate safety as a question susceptible of doubt. For a few minutes I remained wrapped in the profoundest meditation. I have a distinct recollection of frequently compressing my lips, putting my forefinger to the side of my nose, and making use of other gesticulations and grimaces common to men who, at ease in their armchairs, Meditate upon matters of intricacy or importance. Having, as I thought, sufficiently collected my ideas, I now, with great caution and deliberation, put my hands behind my back and unfastened the large iron buckle which belonged to the waistband of my inexpressibles. This buckle had three teeth, which, being somewhat rusty, turned with great difficulty on their axis. I brought them, however, after some trouble, at right angles to the body of the buckle. And was glad to find them remain firm in that position. This sort of specificity, is that like some Robinson Crusoe sort of like survivalist thing? Yeah, it's like a good mix between like this, like the impulse in science fiction to describe every minute detail of the ship and like survival literature, like yeah. Robinson Crusoe. What was that when we read in uh, Hatchet in oh, uh, yeah, Middle right. School being like, Describing the fur of the bear. Type P by Melville also has some yes. of that. Um, At least there's like metaphysic there. Yeah, well, yeah, I much, I think, yeah, Me- oh, Melville's on a, another level, but. Holding the instrument thus obtained within my teeth, I now proceeded to untie the knot of my cravat. I had to rest several times before I could accomplish this maneuver, but it was at length accomplished. To one end of the cravat, I then made fast the buckle, and the other end I tied for greater security tightly around my wrist. Drawing now my body upwards, with a prodigious exertion of muscular force, I succeeded at the very first trial in throwing the buckle over the car and entangling it, as I had anticipated, in the circular rim of the wickerwork. My body was now inclined towards the side of the car at an angle of about 45 degrees. But it must not be understood that I was therefore only 45 degrees below the perpendicular. So far from it, I still lay nearly level with the plane of the horizon, for the change of situation which I had acquired had forced the bottom of the car considerably outwards from my position, which was accordingly one of the most imminent and deadly peril. It should be remembered, however, that when I fell in the first instance from the car, If I had fallen with my face turned toward the balloon instead of turned outwardly from it as it actually was, or if, in the second place, the cord by which I was suspended had chanced to hang over the upper edge instead of through a crevice near the bottom of the car, I say it may be readily conceived that in either of these supposed cases I should have been unable to accomplish even as much as I had now accomplished, and the wonderful adventures of Hans Fall would have been utterly lost to posterity. I had, therefore, every reason to be grateful, although in point of fact I was too stupid to be anything at all, <laughs> and hung for perhaps a quarter of an hour in that extraordinary manner, God. without making the slightest farther exertion whatsoever, and in a singularly tranquil state of idiotic enjoyment. But this feeling did not fail to die rapidly away, and thereunto succeeded horror and dismay and a chilling sense of utter helplessness and ruin. In fact, the blood so long accumulating in the vessels of my head and throat, and which had hitherto buoyed up my spirits with madness and delirium, had now begun to retire within their proper channels, and the distinctness which was thus added to my perception of the danger merely served to deprive me of the self-possession and courage to encounter it. But this weakness was, luckily for me, of no very long duration. 
In good time came to my rescue the spirit of despair, and with frantic cries and struggles I jerked my way bodily upwards, till at length, clutching with a vice-like grip the long-desired rim, I writhed my person over it and fell headlong and shuddering within the car. It was not until some time afterward that I recovered myself sufficiently to attend to the ordinary cares of the balloon. I then, however, examined it with attention, and found it, to my great relief, uninjured. My implements were all safe, and fortunately I had lost neither ballast nor provisions. Indeed, I had so well secured them in their places that such an accident was entirely out of the question. Looking at my watch, I found it six o'clock. I was still rapidly ascending, and my barometer gave a present altitude of three and three-quarter miles. Now, here is where we're going to get into, I think, Hans making his pitch to why uh, Superbus von Underduk should... Uh, value what he has to say Mm -hmm. uh, because he gets into a bit of a military industrial uh, uh, sort of uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. Immediately beneath me in the ocean lay a small black object, slightly oblong in shape, seemingly about the size and in every way bearing a great resemblance to one of those childish toys called a domino. Bringing my telescope to bear upon it, I plainly discerned it to be a British 94-gun ship, close-hauled and pitching heavily in the sea, with her head to the west-southwest. Besides this ship, I saw nothing but the ocean and the sky and the sun, which had long arisen. It is now high time that I should explain to your excellencies the object of my perilous voyage. Your excellencies will bear in mind that distressed circumstances in Rotterdam had at length driven me to the resolution of committing suicide. It was not, however, that to life itself I had any positive disgust, but that I was harassed beyond endurance by the adventitious miseries attending my situation. In this state of mind, wishing to live, yet wearied with life, the treatise at the stall of the bookseller opened a resource to my imagination. I then finally made up my mind. I determined to depart, yet live, to leave the world, yet continue to exist. In short, To drop enigmas, I resolved, let what would ensue, to force a passage, if I could, to the moon. Now, lest I should be supposed more of a madman than I actually am, I will detail as well as I am able the considerations which led me to believe that an achievement of this nature, although without doubt difficult, and incontestably full of danger, was not absolutely, to a bold spirit, beyond the confines of the possible." End of the unparalleled adventures of one Hans Fall, part one. So I, I really like that description. You know, he made up to um, his determined to depart yet live, to leave the world yet continue to exist. Mm-hmm. It, the it, that's like the romantic hero's ethos. I, I think it's Harold Bloom who I will not be citing very often mm-hmm. on, on these episodes. However, I kind of came up with there's a two there's two parts in the hero's journey of the romantic poet. Uh, the first is the Promethean stage, which is you have to reject the falseness of society and uh, the people around you. And the second is the real man stage. And that's, you can only attain freedom by plunging deep like, within yourself and finding your, the true reality of existence. And in that sense, coming back into harmony with a greater sense of like a cosmic society rather than just the falseness of the one in front of you. And that's like you know, Byron Keats and Shelley's uh, the thrusts of their work uh, are very interested in that subject. And, and here you have this hero who wants to do the same thing, but it, Poe uh, transmutes it into like a, a very literal sense of mm-hmm. like, I'm literally leaving earth as a way of discovering a, a, a my deeper self. Like I'm going to be in the world, but not of the world. Right. Yeah. And that's all, that's the thing about space travel. You know, when you talk about, um, sh- would you ever want to go to Mars or the moon? It's like, I, c- I kind of would rather just go to like Paris and go to like, like see G- like Tokyo or something like that. Mm-hmm. And if you go to one of those places, you, I mean, well, we'll fu- we don't know if Hans can come back or not yet, but uh, in in our time, you can't come back. Like, if you go to mm-hmm. Mars, you're never seeing London again. You're never seeing New York City. You're done with that stuff. You're never seeing anybody you love yeah. again, unless they're with you. 
um, at least in, in the flesh. Um, all right. And now let's get to part two of the unparalleled adventures of one Hans fall recording by Dale Hodge, the works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven edition volume one. The moon's actual distance from the earth was the first thing to be attended to. Now the mean or average interval between the centers of the two planets is 59.9643 of the earth's equatorial radii, or about 237,000 miles. I say the mean or average interval, but it must be borne in mind that the form of the moon's orbit being an ellipse of eccentricity amounting to no less than 0 0.05484, of the major semi-axis of the ellipse itself, and the Earth's center being situated in its focus, if I could, in any manner, contrive to meet the moon, as it were, in its perigee, the above-mentioned distance would be materially diminished. So this isn't that interesting, but it, it's mainly interesting in sort of a meta sense in that it's appropriated in a genre of writing that's not fiction, right? Scientific writing being precise with... Um, the mathematics of it. Uh, apparently, this all checks out, or more or less, too. Yeah, yeah. It's not. Um, it's not every day that you um, read a piece of fiction where the narrative you can literally measure as it's going along. Yeah, and that. I mean, this isn't going to be as we'll find out in a little bit. This isn't going to be a very good story for the uh, flat earthers. But the, de the the description of the way the, the roundness of the Earth, he starts getting into like how much of the sphere he can see, calculating that. It's, it's I think it is one of the more imaginatively interesting things that I've thought of it um, since I've read the story. Well, I mean, it's a hoax. Oh yeah, well yeah, but but he does a good job at it. I yeah, guess. yeah. But to say nothing at present of this possibility, it was very certain that, at all events, from the 237,000 miles, I would have to deduct the radius of the Earth, say 4,000, and the radius of the Moon, say 1,080, in all 5,080, leaving an actual interval to be traversed under average circumstances of 231,920 miles. Now this, I reflected, was no very extraordinary distance. Traveling on land has been repeatedly accomplished at the rate of 30 miles per hour, mm -hmm. and indeed, a much greater speed may be anticipated. But even at this velocity, it would take me no more than 322 days to reach the surface of the moon. There were, however, many particulars inducing me to believe that my average rate of traveling might possibly very much exceed that of 30 miles per hour, and, as these considerations did not fail to make a deep impression upon my mind, I will mention them more fully hereafter. The next point to be regarded was a matter of far greater importance. From indications afforded by the barometer, we find that, in ascensions from the surface of the earth, we have, at the height of 1,000 feet, left below us about one-thirtieth of the entire mass of atmospheric air. That at 10,600, we have ascended through nearly one-third, and that at 18,000, which is not far from the elevation of Cotopaxi, we have surmounted one-half the material, or, at all events, one-half the ponderable body of air incumbent upon our globe. It is also calculated that at an altitude not exceeding the hundredth part of the Earth's diameter, that is, not exceeding 80 miles, the rarefication would be so excessive that animal life could in no manner be sustained, and, moreover, that the most delicate means we possess of ascertaining the presence of the atmosphere would be inadequate to assure us of its existence. But I did not fail to perceive that these latter calculations are founded altogether on our experimental knowledge of the properties of air, and the mechanical laws regulating its dilation and compression in what may be called, comparatively speaking, the immediate vicinity of the earth itself. And, at the same time, it is taken for granted that animal life is, and must be, essentially incapable of modification at any given unattainable distance from the surface. Now all such reasoning, and from such data, must, of course, be simply analogical. The greatest height ever reached by man was that of 25,000 feet, attained in the aeronautic expedition of Messrs. Guy Lussac and Biot. This is a moderate altitude, even when compared with the 80 miles in question, and I could not help thinking that the subject admitted room for doubt and great latitude for speculation. But, 
In point of fact, an ascension being made to any given altitude, the ponderable quantity of air surmounted in any farther ascension is by no means in proportion to the additional height ascended, as may be plainly seen from what has been stated before, but in a ratio constantly decreasing. It is therefore evident that, Ascend as high as we may, we cannot, literally speaking, arrive at a limit beyond which no atmosphere is to be found. It must exist, I argued, although it may exist in a state of infinite rarefication. On the other hand, I was aware that arguments have not been wanting to prove the existence of a real and definite limit to the atmosphere beyond... This is interesting because this is the big obstacle to the story making sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like a balloon can't keep going up if the atmosphere disappears and it just becomes a space vacuum. Yeah. And they still they still think of the um, the ether as a thing too, but he, like he's saying there must be a little bit of atmosphere to yeah, get yeah, through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of like practical common sense there like it can't just be zero yeah and uh in his notes to this where he talks the later notes after this is years after this is written where he's talking about the moon hoax he calls the um rigmarole is the term he assigns to uh this sort of like scientific sounding argle bargle where it's sort Mm -hmm. of like trying to make it sound like it means something but it doesn't it reminds me of all that like professional jargon in like procedural tv shows like about doctors or or cops when they just like yeah. throw out like a line of jargon you're like oh my oh my god is it really going to be a rico case yeah. like i have no idea what that means or collateralized debt obligations yeah 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 rarification on the other hand i was aware that arguments have not been wanting to prove the existence of a real and definite limit to the atmosphere beyond which there is absolutely no air whatsoever But a circumstance which has been left out of view by those who contend for such a limit seemed to me, although no positive refutation of their creed, still a point worthy very serious investigation. On comparing the intervals between the successive arrivals of Encke's comet at its perihelion, after giving credit in the most exact manner for all the disturbances due to the attractions of the planets, it appears that the periods are gradually diminishing. That is to say, the major axis of the comet's ellipse is growing shorter in a slow but perfectly regular decrease. Now this is precisely what ought to be the case if we suppose a resistance experienced from the comet from an extremely rare ethereal medium pervading the regions of its orbit. For it is evident that such a medium must, in retarding the comet's velocity, increase its centripetal by weakening its centrifugal force. In other words, the sun's attraction would be constantly attaining greater power, and the comet would be drawn nearer at every revolution. Indeed, there is no other way of accounting for the variation in question. But again, the real diameter of the same comet's nebulosity is observed to contract rapidly as it approaches the sun and dilate with equal rapidity in its departure toward its aphelion. Was I not justifiable in supposing, with them vols, that this apparent condensation of volume has its origin in the compression of the same ethereal medium I have spoken of before, and which is only denser in proportion to its solar vicinity? The lenticular-shaped phenomenon, also called the zodiacal light, was a matter worthy of attention. This radiance, so apparent in the tropics, and which cannot be mistaken for any meteoric luster, extends from the horizon obliquely upward and follows generally the direction of the sun's equator. It appeared to me evidently in the nature of a rare atmosphere extending from the sun outward, beyond the orbit of Venus at least, and I believed indefinitely farther. Indeed, this medium I could not suppose confined to the path of the comet's ellipse or to the immediate neighborhood of the sun. It was easy, on the contrary, to imagine it pervading the entire regions of our planetary system, condensed into what we call atmosphere at the planets themselves, and perhaps at some of them modified by considerations, so to speak, purely geological. Having adopted this view of the subject, I had little further hesitation, granting that on my passage I should meet with atmosphere essentially the same as at the surface of the Earth. Mm. I conceived that, by means of the very ingenious apparatus of M. Grimm, I should readily be enabled to condense it in sufficient quantity for the purposes of respiration. This would remove the chief obstacle in a journey to the moon. I had indeed spent some money 
and great labor in adapting the apparatus to the object intended and confidently looked forward to its successful application. If I could manage to complete the voyage within any reasonable period. This brings me back to the rate at which it might be possible to travel. It is true that balloons, in the first stage of their ascensions from the earth, are known to rise with a velocity comparatively moderate. Now the power of elevation lies altogether in the superior lightness of the gas in the balloon compared with the atmospheric air. And, at first sight, it does not appear probable that, as the balloon acquires altitude and consequently arrives successively in atmospheric strata of densities rapidly diminishing, I say it does not appear at all reasonable that, in this, its progress upwards, the original velocity should be accelerated. On the other hand, I was not aware that, in any recorded ascension, a diminution was apparent in the absolute rate of ascent. Although such should have been the case, if on account of nothing else, on account of the escape of gas through balloons ill-constructed and varnished with no better material than the ordinary varnish. It seemed, therefore, that the effect of such escape was only sufficient to counterbalance the effect of some accelerating power. I now considered that, provided in my passage, I found the medium I had imagined, and provided that it should prove to be actually and essentially what we denominate atmospheric air, it could make comparatively little difference at what extreme state of rarefication I should discover it. That is to say, in regard to my power of ascending, for the gas in the balloon would not only be itself subject to rarefication partially similar, in proportion to the occurrence of which I could suffer an escape of so much as would be requisite to prevent explosion, but, being what it was, would, at all events, continue specifically lighter than any compound whatever of mere nitrogen and oxygen. In the meantime, the force of gravitation would be constantly diminishing in proportion to the squares of the distances, and thus, with a velocity prodigiously accelerating, I should at length arrive in those distant regions where the force of the Earth's attraction would be superseded by that of the Moon. In accordance with these ideas, I did not think it worth while to encumber myself with more provisions than would be sufficient for a period of forty days. There was still, however, another difficulty which occasioned me some little disquietude. It has been observed that, in balloon ascensions to any considerable height, besides the pain attending respiration, great uneasiness is experienced about the head and body often accompanied with bleeding at the nose and other symptoms of an alarming kind, and growing more and more inconvenient in proportion to the altitude attained. This was a reflection of a nature somewhat startling. Was it not probable that these symptoms would increase indefinitely, or at least until terminated by death itself? I finally thought not. Their origin was to be looked for in the progressive removal of the customary atmospheric pressure upon the surface of the body, and consequent distension of the superficial blood vessels, not in any positive disorganization of the animal system, as in the case of difficulty in breathing, where the atmospheric density is chemically insufficient for the due renovation of blood in a ventricle of the heart. Unless, for default of this renovation, I could see no reason, therefore, why life could not be sustained even in a vacuum. For the expansion and compression of chest, commonly called breathing, is action purely muscular, and the cause, not the effect, of respiration. In a word, I conceive that as the body should become habituated to the want of atmospheric pressure, the sensations of pain would gradually diminish, and to endure them while they continued, I relied with confidence upon the iron hardihood of my constitution. The now that part drags a little bit, I think. I mean, it's it's a bit maddening, almost, yeah. because he's a character, and he's it, you spend so much time in in Hans Fall's psyche, you know, and like he's like, I'm gonna kill myself. He's like, I'm gonna kill other people. He's like, I gotta get off this planet. It's just high drama, high stakes, and then it's just like, all right, we need to talk about the rotation of the Earth <laughs> for yeah. a couple hundred words. Yeah, and it, it, it's like it's sort of previewing the obstacles mm -hmm. but instead of like oh we're gonna have this desert to cross we're gonna have like this to deal with it's uh we might not be able to breathe and it might start hurting yeah uh and it, it, it is sort of like a previewing and foreshadowing terrain i guess maybe not imaginatively thought of before yeah so do you know how successful this hoax was well he it, it wasn't even originally presented as a hoax it was presented right. as like a tale of fancy i see because i would imagine the average you know penny paper reader getting to this point being like 
I don't know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know and, how interested I am. Well, and also, this wasn't a penny paper. This was originally the Southern Literary Messenger. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so it was more in a in, in less of a, where he was a critic as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, there we go. Pizza time. Well, I can't remember if we mentioned it earlier, but I do what I appreciate, even though this the narrative pace right here is at, uh, I would say, a crawl, basically. Yeah. But... The idea that the author is like, it's going to be this genre, and then it's going to be this genre. It still has a rapid-fire sense, like an urgency sense to it, where this seems completely different, almost. Like, it's copy-pasted from something, from a different story, almost. Yeah. That it just, the rapidity in which this, like, piece is written, you just like, oh, no, now we're reading, like, now the story's being told through this lens. It's almost like reading... uh like Joyce, like switching through genre to get you like a 3D image of a story. Yeah, it is. And you'll get, we'll get like sort of diary style later. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it is really like a magazine in a single story. Yeah. Patients of pain would gradually diminish and to endure them while they continued, I relied with confidence upon the iron hardihood of my constitution. Thus, may it please your excellencies, I have detailed some though by no means all, the considerations which led me to form the project of a lunar voyage. I shall now proceed to lay before you the result of an attempt so apparently audacious in conception and, at all events, so utterly unparalleled in the annals of mankind. Having attained the altitude before mentioned, that is to say three miles and three quarters, I threw out from the car a quantity of feathers and found that I still ascended with sufficient rapidity. Science. There was, therefore, no necessity for discharging any ballast. I was glad of this, for I wished to retain with me as much weight as I could carry, for reasons which will be explained in the sequel. I, as yet, suffered no bodily inconvenience, breathing with great freedom and feeling no pain whatever in the head. The cat was lying very demurely upon my coat, which I had taken off, and eyeing the pigeons with an air of nonchalance. These latter, being tied by the leg to prevent their escape, were busily employed in picking up some grains of rice scattered for them in the bottom of the car. I love that. I love that image. At 20 minutes past 6 o'clock, the barometer showed an elevation of 26,400 feet. This balloon rapidly accelerating the pole from the earth and then... The Hans uh, fall just looking down, and these pigeons are none the wiser <laughs> to this like interstellar trip that they're taking. Yeah, and I don't think uh, Hans is a reliable narrator when he talks about these animals either. Oh, really? No, I think I, I, maybe I'm a bit too suspicious of him, but the way that he. Well, we'll see. Okay. The, the way some of them meet their end is a bit suspicious mm. to me. It's scattered for them in the bottom of the car. At 20 minutes past 6 o'clock, the barometer showed an elevation of 26,400 feet, or 5 miles to a fraction. The prospect seemed unbounded. Indeed, it is very easily calculated by means of spherical geometry what a great extent of the Earth's area I beheld. The convex surface of any segment of a sphere is, to the entire surface of the sphere itself, as the versed sign of the segment to the diameter of the sphere. Now, in my case, the verse sign, that is to say the thickness of the segment beneath me, was about equal to my elevation, or the elevation of the point of sight above the surface. As five miles, then, to 8,000 would express the proportion of the Earth's area seen by me. In other words, I beheld as much as a 1,600th part of the whole surface of the globe. The sea appeared unruffled as a mirror, although, by means of the spyglass, I could perceive it to be in a state of violent agitation. The ship was no longer visible, having drifted away, apparently to the eastward. I now began to experience, at intervals, severe pain in the head, especially about the ears, still, however, breathing with tolerable freedom. The cat and pigeons seemed to suffer no inconvenience whatsoever. At 20 minutes... This is where it's really picking up, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I, like, I really like this part of the story. Yeah, it, it's, it works so well that he's the only one, and that he's never done it before, because mm-hmm. it gets this, like... He could die at any moment, basically. Ears. Still, however, breathing with tolerable freedom. The cat and pigeons seemed to suffer no inconvenience whatsoever. At 20 minutes before 7, the balloon entered a long series of dense clouds, which put me in great trouble by damaging my condensing apparatus and wetting me to the skin. This was, to be sure, a singular rencontre. 
for I had not believed it possible that a cloud of this nature could be sustained at so great an elevation. I thought it best, however, to throw out two five-pound pieces of ballast, reserving still a weight of 165 pounds. Upon so doing, I soon rose above the difficulty and perceived immediately that I had obtained a great increase in my rate of ascent. In a few seconds after my leaving the cloud, a flash of vivid lightning shot from one end of it to the other and caused it to kindle up throughout its vast extent like a mass of ignited and glowing charcoal. This, it must be remembered, was in the broad light of day. No fancy may picture the sublimity which might have been exhibited by a similar phenomenon taking place amid the darkness of the night. Hell itself might have been found a fitting image. Even as it was, my hair stood on end while I gazed afar down within the yawning abysses, letting imagination descend, as it were, and stalk about in the strange vaulted halls and ruddy gulfs and red ghastly chasms of the hideous and unfathomable fire. That's the sort of classic Poe dark romanticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, and it'll come up later, but I really appreciate... Um, imagining a revelation as something not immediately enjoyable, but actually quite terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm always really skeptical. It could be like the fact that I was raised Catholic, but like I'm always really skeptical of uh, any kind of like insight being that you're doing everything right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I feel like is like most insight. Right. That you're actually okay. Whereas like I would feel most, if I were to receive an insight about how the universe works, it'd probably be horrific because it's so alien that I could, couldn't even understand it. So this guy going through, going through this, punching through, and then only likening it to hell, like, yeah, that seems very real. <laughs> We've all been in airplanes. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I, I'm sure you have. I, I've been in a plane when there's a thunderstorm outside. Mm -hmm. It is terrifying. Yeah. It's fucking insane. And so this description of it is actually like fairly accurate and well, like he guessed well what it would be like to be inside a thunderstorm. When that is true. Happening. And once your feet are off the ground, how vulnerable you are because mm -hmm. you're just in this like capsule where he's just in like a balloon. Yeah. Just completely at the mercy of these like capricious acts of extremely violent nature. I had indeed made a narrow escape. Had the balloon remained a very short while longer within the cloud, that is to say, had not the inconvenience of getting wet determined me to discharge the ballast, inevitable ruin would have been the consequence. Such perils, although little considered, are perhaps the greatest which must be encountered in balloons. I had by this time, however, attained too great an elevation to be any longer uneasy on this head. I was now rising rapidly, and by seven o'clock the barometer indicated an altitude of no less than nine miles and a half. I began to find great difficulty in drawing my breath. My head, too, was excessively painful, and, having felt for some time a moisture about my cheeks, I at length discovered it to be blood, which was oozing quite fast from the drums of my ears. My eyes also gave me great uneasiness. Upon passing the hand over them, they seemed to have protruded from their sockets in no inconsiderable degree, and all objects in the car, and even the balloon itself, appeared distorted to my vision." These symptoms were more than I had expected, and occasioned me some alarm. At this juncture, very imprudently and without consideration, I threw out from the car three five-pound pieces of ballast. The accelerated rate of ascent thus obtained carried me too rapidly and without sufficient gradation into a highly rarefied stratum of the atmosphere, and the result had nearly proved fatal to my expedition and to myself. I was suddenly seized with a spasm which lasted for more than five minutes, and even when this, in a measure, ceased, I could catch my breath only at long intervals and in a gasping manner, bleeding all the while copiously at the nose and ears, and even slightly at the eyes. The pigeons appeared distressed in the extreme and struggled to escape, while the cat mewed piteously and, with her tongue hanging out of her mouth, staggered to and fro in the car as if under the influence of poison. I feel so sad for this cat. I now too late discovered the great rashness of which I had been guilty. Just like, he can't even see straight and blood is coming out of his ears and he's like, oh, I hope the cat's okay. And yet the cat is also like being tortured. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of animal cruelty in this story. Mm -hmm. The in discharging the ballast staggered to and fro in the car as if under the influence of poison. 
I now too late discovered the great rashness of which I had been guilty in discharging the ballast, and my agitation was excessive. I anticipated nothing less than death, and death in a few minutes. The physical suffering I underwent contributed also to render me nearly incapable of making any exertion for the preservation of my life. I had indeed little power of reflection left, and the violence of the pain in my head seemed to be greatly on the increase. Thus, I found that my senses would shortly give way altogether, and I had already clutched one of the valve ropes with the view of attempting a descent, when the recollection of the trick I had played the three creditors, and the possible consequences to myself should I return, operated to deter me for the moment. Keeping his eye on the ball. I lay down in the bottom of the car and endeavored to collect my faculties. In this, I so far succeeded as to determine upon the experiment of losing blood. Having no lancet, however, I was constrained to perform the operation in the best manner I was able, and finally succeeded in opening a vein in my right arm with the blade of my penknife. The blood had hardly commenced flowing when I experienced a sensible relief, and, by the time I had lost about half a moderate basin full, most of the worst symptoms had abandoned me entirely. So I, like I nevertheless that. did not think it expedient to attempt getting on my... I like that it's a confirmation that bloodletting is actually correct. That yeah, it works. In space travel, to get <clears throat> acclimated to this new climate, you have to lose half a bucket of blood, basically. Yeah, Buzz Ald- Aldrin opened his veins and... Famously took a penknife to his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that can solve it. I mean, maybe... <sighs> He, re- reading it again now, it's like I don't really remember him being a very scientific person, like a very scientific character at the beginning. He doesn't seem too terribly inquisitive about like the material world around him, but in this, he's like constantly uh, experimenting, or he's like fully ready to like, no, this this will do the trick. But as far as we know, it's all based on finding that pamphlet. About yeah, I guess so. air travel. Like it, it basically like set him off on this. And if he's a passive, if if this is a world where people are passive uh, sort of recipients of print culture, mm-hmm. and that leads them to like you know do the automated puff on your pipe response and walk oh, around in yeah. circles, he's also like he's just following his part of the process. Yeah, that's true. I feed immediately, but having tied up my arm as well I could, I lay still for about a quarter of an hour. At the end of this time, I arose and found myself freer from absolute pain of any kind than I had been during the last hour and a quarter of my ascension. The difficulty of breathing, however, was diminished in a very slight degree, and I found that it would soon be positively necessary to make use of my condenser. In the meantime, looking toward the cat, who was again snugly stowed away upon my coat, I discovered, to my infinite surprise, that she had taken the opportunity of my indisposition to bring into light a litter of three little kittens. This was in addition to the number of passengers on my part. I mean, as far as plot twists go, that's a that's a nice one. He's like uh, narrowly escaped death by releasing a lot of blood from your body and looking over, and the cat passenger has given birth. <laughs> of my indisposition. To bring into light a litter of three little kittens. This was in addition to the number of passengers on my part altogether unexpected, but I was pleased at the occurrence. It would afford me a chance of bringing to a kind of test the truth of a surmise, which, more than anything else, had influenced me in attempting this ascension. I had imagined that the habitual endurance of the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the earth was the cause, or nearly so, of the pain attending animal existence at a distance above the surface. Should the kittens be found to suffer uneasiness in an equal degree with their mother, I must consider my theory in fault. But a failure to do so, I should look upon as a strong confirmation of my idea. By eight o'clock, I had actually attained an elevation of 17 miles above the surface of the earth. Thus, it seemed to me evident that my rate of ascent was not only on the increase, but that the progression would have been apparent in a slight degree even had I not discharged the ballast which I did. The pains in my head and ears returned, at intervals, with violence, and I still continued to bleed occasionally at the nose. But, upon the whole, I suffered much less than might have been expected. I breathed, however, at every moment, with more and more difficulty, and each inhalation was attended with a troublesome spasmodic action of the chest. I now unpacked the condensing apparatus and got it ready for immediate use. 
The view of the earth at this period of my ascension was beautiful indeed. This is like the sort of pale blue dot moment. Mm -hmm. To the westward, the northward, and the southward, as far as I could see, lay a boundless sheet of apparently unruffled ocean, which every moment gained a deeper and a deeper tint of blue, and began already to assume a slight appearance of convexity. At a vast distance to the eastward, although perfectly discernible, extended the islands of Great Britain, the entire Atlantic coasts of France and Spain, with a small portion of the northern part of the continent of Africa. Of individual edifices, not a trace could be discovered, and the proudest cities of mankind had utterly faded away from the face of the earth. From the rock of Gibraltar, now dwindled into a dim speck, the dark Mediterranean sea, dotted with shining islands as the heaven is dotted with stars, spread itself out to the eastward as far as my vision extended, until its entire mass of waters seemed at length to tumble headlong over the abyss of the horizon, and I found myself listening on tiptoe for the echoes of the mighty cataract. Overhead, the sky was of a jetty black, and the stars were brilliantly visible." The pigeons about this time, seeming to undergo much suffering, I determined upon giving them their liberty. I first untied one of them, a beautiful grey-mottled pigeon, and placed him upon the rim of the wickerwork. He appeared extremely uneasy, looking anxiously around him, fluttering his wings and making a loud cooing noise, but could not be persuaded to trust himself from off the car. I took him up at last, and threw him to about half a dozen yards from the balloon. He made, however, no attempt to descend, as I had expected, but struggled with great vehemence to get back, uttering at the same time very shrill and piercing cries. Jesus. He at length succeeded in regaining his former station on the rim, but had hardly done so when his head dropped upon his breast, and he fell dead within the car. The other one did not prove so unfortunate. To prevent his following the example of his companion and accomplishing a return, I threw him downward with all my force, and was pleased to find him continue his descent with great velocity, making use of his wings with ease, and in a perfectly natural manner. And I mean, just great. I mean, okay, glad it worked. Yeah, yeah. But like, I'm just going to throw him down here as hard as I can and hope he makes it. Yeah, this one just struggled on to death, and he's like, mm, well. And we're just supposed to trust his, like, intent, right? Yeah. Like, like not like, I'm sick of this fucking bird, get yeah. the hell out of here, and, and it just happens to float away. Like, I understand, like, the scientific impulse of bringing, like, other creatures with you, but the image of a guy throwing pigeons off of his balloon in inner space is like demented yeah and, and the other one and the first one not working out so he's like well i'm gonna throw this one <laughs> yeah and it's like it's the sort of thing where we've already heard about three debtors getting blown to smithereens yeah 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 but the, but the way he describes like the cat struggling and like the pigeon dying as it tries to get back to the balloon because it realizes it's way too fucking high yeah 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 like it's it, it's heartbreaking. I hate it. Like, well, I mean, it's, it's good writing, but it's like it's it, it feels cheap almost. Yeah, yeah. It's I don't know cheap. It's it's not cheap, but it's like it's very sentimental. It really. Oh, really? I I feel okay. like it just really plays against type for like what an app what, what we would think in the twenty first century an, uh, an astronaut would be. Mm. Whereas this guy's like a borderline like ill. <laughs> yeah, clearly, is and that being, his a, end of his luck? Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Being like, oh, cool, a cat just gave birth. I'm about to throw these pigeons out, and I'm and then be on my way to the moon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Word with all my force and was pleased to find him continue his descent with great velocity, making use of his wings with ease, and in a perfectly natural manner. In a very short time, he was out of sight, and I had no doubt he reached home in safety. Okay. Puss, no doubt. who seemed in a great measure recovered from her illness, now made a hearty meal of the dead bird, and then went to sleep with much apparent satisfaction. Okay. Her kittens were quite lively, and so far evinced not the slightest sign of any uneasiness whatever. Everything in its right place. At a quarter past eight, being no longer able to draw breath without the most intolerable pain, I proceeded forthwith to adjust around the car the apparatus belonging to the condenser. This apparatus will require some little explanation, and your excellencies will please to bear in mind that my object in the first place was to surround myself and cat entirely with a barricade against the highly rarefied atmosphere in which I was existing. With the int this is where he starts basically describing an early space capsule. Mm -hmm. And I think it's less tedious than the descriptions of why he thought he'd be able to breathe and why he thought there was atmosphere. Yeah. 
intention of introducing within this barricade by means of my con- entirely with a barricade against the highly rarefied atmosphere in which I was existing, with the intention of introducing within this barricade by means of my condenser a quantity of this same atmosphere sufficiently condensed for the purposes of respiration. With this object in view, I had prepared a very strong, perfectly airtight but flexible gum elastic bag. In this bag, which was of sufficient dimensions, the entire car was in a manner placed. That is to say, it, the bag, was drawn over the whole bottom of the car, up its sides, and so on, along the outside of the ropes, to the upper rim or hoop where the network is attached. Having pulled the bag up in this way and formed a complete enclosure on all sides and at bottom, it was now necessary to fasten up its top or mouth by passing its material over the hoop of the network, in other words, between the network and the hoop. But if the network were separated from the hoop to admit this passage, what was to sustain the car in the meantime? Now the network was not permanently fastened to the hoop, but attached by a series of running loops or nooses. I therefore undid only a few of these loops at one time, leaving the car suspended by the remainder. Having thus inserted a portion of the cloth, forming the upper part of the bag, I refastened the loops. Not to the hoop, for that would have been impossible, since the cloth now intervened, but to a series of large buttons affixed to the cloth itself, about three feet below the mouth of the bag, the intervals between the buttons having been made to correspond to the intervals between the loops. This done, a few more of the loops were unfastened from the rim, a farther portion of the cloth introduced, and the disengaged loops then connected with their proper buttons. In this way it was possible to insert the whole upper part of the bag between the network and the hoop. It is evident that the hoop would now drop down within the car, while the whole weight of the car itself, with all its contents, would be held up merely by the strength of the buttons. This, at first sight, would seem an inadequate dependence. But it was by no means so, for the buttons were not only very strong in themselves, but so close together that a very slight portion of the whole weight was supported by any one of them. Indeed, had the car and contents been three times heavier than they were, I should not have been at all uneasy. I now raised up the hoop again within the covering of gum elastic and propped it at nearly its former height by means of three light poles prepared for the occasion. This was done, of course, to keep the bag distended at the top and to preserve the lower part of the network in its proper situation. All that now remained was to fasten up the mouth of the enclosure, and this was readily accomplished by gathering the folds of the material together and twisting them up very tightly on the inside by means of a kind of stationary tourniquet. In the sides of the covering thus adjusted round the car had been inserted three circular panes of thick but clear glass, through which I could see without difficulty around me in every horizontal direction. In that portion of the cloth forming the bottom was likewise a fourth window of the same kind and corresponding with the small aperture in the floor of the car itself. This enabled me to see perpendicularly down, but having found it impossible to place any similar contrivance overhead on account of the peculiar manner of closing up the opening there and the consequent wrinkles in the cloth, I could expect to see no objects situated directly in my zenith. This, of course, was a matter of little consequence, for had I even been able to place a window at top, the balloon itself would have prevented my making any use of it. About a foot below one of the side windows was a circular opening, eight inches in diameter, and fitted with a brass rim adapted in its inner edge to the windings of a screw. In this rim was screwed the large tube of the condenser, the body of the machine being, of course, within the chamber of gum elastic. Through this tube, a quantity of the rare atmosphere circumjacent being drawn by means of a vacuum created in the body of the machine was thence discharged in a state of condensation to mingle with the thin air already in the chamber. This operation, being repeated several times at length, filled the chamber with atmosphere proper for all the purposes of respiration. But in so confined a space it would, in a short time, necessarily become foul and unfit for use from frequent contact with the lungs. It was then ejected by a small valve at the bottom of the car. The dense air... That idea of needing to circle the air out because you've breathed it in too many times is kind of morbid and a good Poe touch, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it has like a, <clears throat> the sense of like a moving um, casket, almost. Yeah, or like almost like a... Like, it's it's weird how sort of, it's basically 
It's like extending human life through robot or mechanics or something mm. like this. Like you're creating this little vessel that is sort of like an external lung. Um, yeah. And like this condenser thing that becomes his sort of like lungs for the duration of the journey. Yeah, it just further emphasizes how much outside help is required for him to survive in this alien terrain. Right. They're readily sinking into the thinner atmosphere below. To avoid the inconvenience of making a total vacuum at any moment within the chamber, this purification was never accomplished all at once, but in a gradual manner, the valve being opened only for a few seconds, then closed again, until one or two strokes from the pump of the condenser had supplied the place of the atmosphere ejected. For the sake of experiment, I had put the cat and kittens in a small basket and suspended it outside the car to a button at the bottom, close by the valve, through which I could feed them at any moment when necessary. I did this at some little risk, and before closing the mouth of the chamber, by reaching under the car with one of the poles before mentioned, to which a hook had been attached. By the time I had fully completed these arrangements and filled the chamber as explained, it wanted only ten minutes of nine o'clock. During the whole period of my being thus employed, I endured the most terrible distress from difficulty of respiration, and bitterly did I repent the negligence, or rather foolhardiness, of which I had been guilty of putting off to the last moment a matter of so much importance. But having at length accomplished it, I soon began to reap the benefit of my invention. Once again, I breathed with perfect freedom and ease. And indeed, why should I not? That reaping the benefit of my invention thing, that's like the 19th century like mm-hmm. um, wet dream, basically, for guys like... Like oh, and and you can see why like right like you uh, again the Robinson Crusoe thing like you've made your little like habitat yeah to suit you and now y- your life is materially better yeah it's like the two it's like having your cake and eat it because it's like I did this all myself and then not having to do another thing again and then autopilot that. yeah 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 I did this and then you just press the button and it's like now I have to do shit. I was also agreeably surprised to find myself in a great measure relieved from the violent pains which had hitherto tormented me. A slight headache accompanied with a sensation of fullness or distension about the wrists, the ankles, and the throat was nearly all of which I had now to complain. Thus it seemed evident that a greater part of the uneasiness attending the removal of atmospheric pressure had actually worn off, as I had expected, and that much of the pain endured for the last two hours should have been attributed altogether to the effects of a deficient respiration. At twenty minutes before nine o'clock, that is to say, a short time prior to my closing up the mouth of the chamber, the mercury attained its limit, or ran down in the barometer, which, as I mentioned before, was one of an extended construction. It then indicated an altitude on my part of 132,000 feet, or 5 and 20 miles. And I consequently surveyed at that time an extent of the Earth's area amounting to no less than the 320th part of its entire superficies. At 9 o'clock I had again lost sight of land to the eastward, but not before I became aware that the balloon was drifting rapidly to the north-northwest. The convexity of the ocean beneath me was very evident indeed, although my view was often interrupted by the masses of cloud which floated to and fro. I observed now that even the lightest vapors never rose to more than ten miles above the level of the sea. At half past nine, I tried the experiment of throwing out a handful of feathers through the valve. They did not float as I had expected, but dropped down perpendicularly like a bullet and mass, and with the greatest velocity, being out of sight in a very few seconds. I did not at first know what to make of this extraordinary phenomenon, not being able to believe that my rate of ascent had, of a sudden, met with so prodigious an acceleration. But it soon occurred to me that the atmosphere was now far too rare to sustain even the feathers, that they actually fell, as they appeared to do, with great rapidity, and that I had been surprised by the united velocities of their descent, and my own elevation. By ten o'clock, I found that I had very little to occupy my immediate attention. Affairs went swimmingly, and I believed the balloon to be going upward with the speed increasing momently, although I had no longer any means of ascertaining the progression of the increase. I suffered no pain or uneasiness of any kind, and enjoyed better spirits than I had at any period since my departure from Rotterdam. 
busying myself now in examining the state of my various apparatus, and now in regenerating the atmosphere within the chamber. This latter point I determined to attend to at regular intervals of 40 minutes, more on account of the preservation of my health than from so frequent a renovation being absolutely necessary. In the meanwhile, I could not help making anticipations. Fancy reveled in the wild and dreamy regions of the moon. Imagination, feeling herself for once unshackled, roamed at will among the ever-changing wonders of a shadowy and unstable land. Now there were hoary and time-honored forests and craggy precipices, and waterfalls tumbling with a loud noise into abysses without a bottom. Dark romantic Poe talking about you know, uh, landscapes again. Yeah, I like that concept of like the physical world can change how you think, Mm -hmm. like change how the contours of your own imagination that it literally takes a change of scenery for him to be, have like a free and open understanding of his own self. Yeah. And, and at this point he's still, um, he's still not actually seeing the moon. It's Mm -hmm. just like thinking about it in the, in the sort of luxury of his sort of condensed air space vessel. Now mm-hmm. he's got everything. Uh, all the emergencies, at least for the moment are, are taken care of. He's really booking it up uh, straight up there to the point where like feathers fall as if they're in just a vacuum. Then I came suddenly into still noonday solitudes where no wind of heaven ever intruded and where vast meadows of poppies and slender lily looking flowers spread themselves out a weary distance all silent and motionless forever. Then again I journeyed far down away into another country where it was all one dim and vague lake with a boundary line of clouds, and out of this melancholy water arose a forest of tall eastern trees like a wilderness of dreams. And I have in mind that the shadows of the trees which fell upon the lake remain not on the surface where they fell, but sunk slowly and steadily down, and commingled with the waves, while from the trunks of the trees other shadows were continually coming out, and taking the place of their brothers thus entombed. This, then, I said thoughtfully, is the very reason why the waters of this lake grow blacker with age and more melancholy as the hours run on. But fancies such as these were not the sole possessors of my brain. Horrors of a nature most stern and most appalling would too frequently obtrude themselves upon my mind and shake the innermost depths of my soul with the bare supposition of their possibility. Yet I would not suffer my thoughts for any length of time to dwell upon these latter speculations, rightly judging the real and palpable dangers of the voyage sufficient for my undivided attention. At five o'clock p.m., being engaged in regenerating the atmosphere within the chamber, I took that opportunity of observing the cat and kittens through the valve. The cat herself appeared to suffer again very much, and I had no hesitation in attributing her uneasiness chiefly to a difficulty in breathing. But my experiment with the kittens had resulted very strangely. I had expected, of course, to see them betray a sense of pain, although in a less degree than their mother, and this would have been sufficient to confirm my opinion concerning the habitual endurance of atmospheric pressure but I was not prepared to find them, upon close examination, evidently enjoying a high degree of health, breathing with the greatest ease and perfect regularity, and evincing not the slightest sign of any uneasiness whatever. So basically, because they were born at a high atmosphere, they're just used to it. Yeah, he takes that idea of like how far you are from sea level, you know, and it takes like, it takes a little time to get acclimated to that climate. He just takes that and extends it all the way going into like the furthest reaches of inner space being like, it just takes an amount of time. So yeah. these like kittens born into it, they're perfectly healthy and fine. I could only account for all this by extending my theory and supposing that the highly rarefied atmosphere around might perhaps not be as I had taken for granted chemically insufficient for the purposes of life. And that a person born in such a medium might possibly be unaware of any inconvenience attending its inhalation while upon removal to the denser strata near the earth he might endure tortures of a similar nature to those i had so lately experienced it has since been to me a matter of deep regret that an awkward accident at this time occasioned me the loss of my little family of cats and deprived me of the insight into this matter which a continued experiment might have afforded 
In passing my hand through the valve with a cup of water for the old puss, the sleeves of my shirt became entangled in the loop which sustained the basket, and thus, in a moment, loosened it from the bottom. Had the hole actually vanished into air, it could not have shot from my sight in a more abrupt and instantaneous manner. Positively, there could not have intervened the tenth part of a second between the disengagement of the basket and its absolute and total disappearance with all that it contained. My good wishes followed it to the earth. But, of course, I had no hope that either cat or kittens would ever live to tell the tale of their misfortune. Yeah. End of The Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall, Part 2. Yeah, that's insane. To be like, I uh, wish you well as you plummet to your death. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay, maybe it was an accident, although I'm suspicious. Like... First of all, he wasn't expecting to have those cats in the first place. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, I was surprised to see they were doing so well. And then this exact same paragraph is like an accident made me jettison them to That's Earth. interesting. But, I mean, I'm, that's probably a bit too conspiratorial. Well, I mean, there's definitely something to be said for the fact that there's zero reaction to what's happening around him anymore. Like, there's no emotional investment. No, like, oh, oh, God. You know, it's just like, good luck. Like, he's even detached from a reality that part of him knows exists. Like, he knows that they're just fell to their death. And yet he's like, he's like, bon voyage. Yeah, exactly. All right. Now uh, let's get to part three right away. Finish this bad boy out. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Novella Serena. The Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall, part three. At six o'clock I perceived a great portion of the Earth's visible area to the eastward involved in thick shadow, which continued to advance with great rapidity until, at five minutes before seven, the whole surface in view was enveloped in the darkness of night. It was not, however, until long after this time that the rays of the setting sun ceased to illumine the balloon. And this circumstance, although of course fully anticipated, did not fail to give me an infinite deal of pleasure. It was evident that, in the morning, I should behold the rising luminary many hours at least before the citizens of Rotterdam, in spite of their situation so much farther to the eastward, and thus, day after day, in proportion to the height ascended, would I enjoy the light of the sun for a longer and a longer period. Now, I don't know if, if this is explicitly about the sun and not just penny presses, but it's interesting, mm. like he's it, talking about the literal sun here. Um, and how he is glad he gets to see it before Rotterdam, and that I, I don't know. Maybe that's being a bit too literal with it. But. No, I think that there's something there, especially when he's literally in a ship made from newspaper. Yeah, and actually, it's it's unclear if this ship he's in now is the same one that comes uh, at the beginning. Oh, yeah, that's true. But I mean, at least that ship did exist in this story. So it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, unless you put it together with, like, moon newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, that comes up in the end where they're like, the, those newspapers are from, like, Europe or someplace like that. So it, Right, but they're not, from a, they're not from not Earth, right? Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah. They're not from not Earth. <laughs> I now determined to keep a journal of my passage, reckoning the days from one to twenty-four hours continuously, without taking into consideration the intervals of darkness. At ten o'clock... Feeling sleepy, I determined to lie down for the rest of the night. But here difficulty presented itself, which, obvious as it may appear, had escaped my attention up to the very moment of which I am now speaking. If I went to sleep as I proposed, how could the atmosphere in the chamber be regenerated in the interim? To breathe it for more than an hour at the farthest would be a matter of impossibility, or... If even this term could be extended to an hour and a quarter, the most ruinous consequences might ensue. The consideration of this dilemma gave me no little disquietude, and it will hardly be believed that after the dangers I had undergone, I should look upon this business in so serious a light as to give up all hope of accomplishing my ultimate design, and finally make up my mind to the necessity of dissent. But this hesitation was only momentary. I reflected that man is the various slave of custom, and that many points in the routine of his existence are deemed essentially important, which are only so at all by his having rendered them habitual. It was very certain that I could not do without sleep, but 
I might easily bring myself to feel no inconvenience from being awakened at intervals of an hour during the whole period of my repose. It would require but five minutes at most to regenerate the atmosphere in the fullest manner, and the only real difficulty was to contrive a method of arousing myself at the proper moment for so doing. But this was a question which, I am willing to confess, occasioned me no little trouble in its solution. To be sure, I had heard of the student who, to prevent his falling asleep over his books, held in one hand a ball of copper, the din of whose descent into a basin of the same metal on the floor beside his chair served effectually to startle him up, if, at any moment, he should be overcome with drowsiness. My own case, however, was very different indeed, and left me no room for any similar idea, for I did not wish to keep awake, but to be aroused from slumber at regular intervals of time. I at length hit upon the following expedient, which, simple as it may seem, was hailed by me, at the moment of discovery, as an invention fully equal to that of the telescope, the steam engine, or the art of printing itself. It is necessary to premise that the balloon... just want to point out him explicitly referencing print as the sort of invention that is ama super amazing there. Oh, yeah. ...aroused from slumber at regular intervals of time. I at length hit upon the following expedient, which, simple as it may seem, was hailed by me, at the moment of discovery, as an invention fully equal to that of the telescope, the steam engine, or the art of printing itself. It is necessary to premise that the balloon, at the elevation now attained, continued its course upward with an even and undeviating ascent, and the car consequently followed with a steadiness so perfect that it would have been impossible to detect in it the slightest vacillation whatever. This circumstance favored me greatly in the project I now determined to adopt. My supply of water had been put on board in kegs containing five gallons each and ranged very securely around the interior of the car. I unfastened one of these and, taking two ropes, tied them tightly across the rim of the wickerwork from one side to the other, placing them about a foot apart and parallel so as to form a kind of shelf upon which I placed the keg and steadied it in a horizontal position. About eight inches immediately below these ropes, and four feet from the bottom of the car, I fastened another shelf, but I made it of thin plank, being the only similar piece of wood I had. Upon this latter shelf, and exactly beneath one of the rims of the keg, a small earthen pitcher was deposited. I now bored a hole in the end of the keg over the pitcher, and fitted a plug of soft wood, cut in a tapering or conical shape. This plug I pushed in or pulled out, as might happen, until after a few experiments it arrived at that exact degree of tightness, at which the water, oozing from the hole and falling into the pitcher below, would fill the ladder to the brim in the period of sixty minutes. This, of course, was a matter briefly and easily ascertained by noticing the proportion of the pitcher filled in any given time. Having arranged all this, the rest of the plan is obvious. My bed was so contrived upon the floor of the car as to bring my head, in lying down, immediately below the mouth of the pitcher. It was evident that, at the expiration of an hour, the pitcher, getting full, would be forced to run over, and to run over at the mouth, which was somewhat lower than the rim. It was also evident that the water thus falling from a height of more than four feet could not do otherwise than fall upon my face, and that the short consequences would be to waken me up instantaneously even from the soundest slumber in the world. It was fully eleven by the time I had completed these arrangements, and I immediately betook myself to bed with full confidence in the efficiency of my invention. Nor in this matter was I disappointed. Punctually, every sixty minutes, was I aroused by my trusty chronometer. When, having emptied the pitcher into the bunghole of the keg and performed the duties of the condenser, I retired again to bed. These regular interruptions to my slumber caused me even less discomfort than I had anticipated, and when I finally arose for the day, it was seven o'clock, and the sun had attained many degrees above the line of my horizon. April 3rd. I found the balloon at an immense height indeed, and the earth's apparent convexity increased in a material degree. Below me in the ocean lay a cluster of black specks, which undoubtedly were islands. Far away to the northward I perceived a thin, white, and exceedingly brilliant line, or streak, on the edge of the horizon, and I had no hesitation in supposing it to be the southern disk of the ices of the polar sea. My curiosity was greatly excited, for I had hopes of passing on much farther to the north, and might possibly, at some period, find myself placed directly above the pole itself. 
I now lamented that my great elevation would, in this case, prevent my taking as accurate a survey as I could wish. Much, however, might be ascertained. Nothing else of an extraordinary nature occurred during the day. My apparatus all continued in good order, and the balloon still ascended without any perceptible vacillation. The cold was intense, and obliged me to wrap up closely in an overcoat. When darkness came over the earth, I betook myself to bed, although it was for many hours afterward broad daylight all around my immediate situation. The water clock was punctual in its duty, and I slept until the next morning soundly, with the exception of a periodical interruption. April 4th. Arose in good health and spirits, and was astonished at... Yeah, I think this stuff where he continues to observe the increasing convexity of the Earth, um, and how it gets, it's more and more globe-like, like, that would have been exciting to read, I feel like, at this time. Yeah, it's like, having never, don't have any images to go off of, or... Yeah. Just knowing that the Earth is round. Basically. Just math, basically. You can yeah. just project yourself there with math and try to imagine what the ice caps, the polar ice caps, would look like, um, and what, uh, as we see, like what basically an eclipse or seeing the dark side of the Earth from a height. Uh, yeah, is very like that would be nuts. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be insane. I, I would do. I would say as like a modern reader, this is probably the slowest part. Oh really? Only because. For me, it's because we've kind of, this has been covered, like, seeing, you know, three sixteenths of the earth and stuff like that. And then mm. talking about the cat, which I was actually very interested in. Yeah. <laughs> the cat having babies and then executing them all. And then to return to it, I'm kind of just like, I don't know. I don't uh, see, know. this is where I start, Ball. especially because there's one part where uh, they where he starts describing the, being able to see the moon f- like by looking straight up around the edges of the balloon. Oh yeah. Um, I, I, I like the, I think that my, to me, I think I didn't already commented, but where they're talking about why he thinks there might be atmosphere and why he thinks he might be able to breathe in low oxygen, like that stuff. I mean, he, he should have zoomed through that basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next morning soundly with the exception of a periodical interruption, April 4th, arose in good health and spirits, and was astonished at the singular change which had taken place in the appearance of the sea. It had lost, in a great measure, the deep tints of blue it had hitherto worn, being now of a grayish white, and of a luster dazzling to the eye. The islands were no longer visible, whether they had passed down the horizon to the southeast, or whether my increasing elevation had left them out of sight, it is impossible to say. I was inclined, however, to the latter opinion." The rim of ice to the northward was growing more and more apparent, cold by no means so intense. Nothing of importance occurred, and I passed the day in reading, having taken care to supply myself with books. <laughs> April 5th. Beheld the singular phenomenon of the sun rising, while nearly the whole visible surface of the earth continued to be involved in darkness. In time, however, the light spread itself over all, and I again saw the line of ice to the northward, it was now very distinct, and appeared of a much darker hue than the waters of the ocean. I was evidently approaching it, and with great rapidity, fancied I could again distinguish a strip of land to the eastward, and one also to the westward, but could not be certain. Weather moderate, nothing of any consequence happened during the day, went early to bed. April 6th, you pause it right was there. surprised at finding the rim of ice at a very moderate distance. There's kind of a moving image of he's the first person to witness the sun, even though the Earth's round, like there's people seeing it. That The world that he knows, he's the first one to see it while everyone is asleep. Mm-hmm. He's like witnessing something from almost like a god perspective yeah and then that i went early to bed is like yeah. you're 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 spending an entire day just with this amazing perspective that nobody else has ever had before and it's mm-hmm. like gosh i it's like almost too much and you're just like well i'll see what tomorrow brings then. yeah it's interesting to see what habits um continue even though he's off the surface of the earth because he he references more than once like i did this at six o'clock and it's like well you know, it's like, it's not really affecting you anymore. Work like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Happened during the day. Went early to bed. April 6th. Was surprised at finding the rim of ice at a very moderate distance, and an immense field of the same material stretching away off to the horizon in the north. It was evident that if the balloon held its present course, it would soon arrive above the frozen ocean, 
and I had now little doubt of ultimately seeing the pole. During the whole of the day I continued to near the ice. Toward night, the limits of my horizon very suddenly and materially increased, owing undoubtedly to the Earth's form of being that of an oblate spheroid, and my arriving above the flattened regions in the vicinity of the Arctic Circle. Mm. When darkness at length overtook me, I went to bed in great anxiety, fearing to pass over the object of so much curiosity, when I should have no opportunity of observing it. April 7th. Arose early, and, to my great joy, at length beheld what there could be no hesitation in supposing the northern pole itself. It was there beyond a doubt, and immediately beneath my feet. But alas, I had now ascended to so vast a distance that nothing could with accuracy be discerned. Indeed, to judge from the progression of the numbers indicating my various altitudes, respectively, at different periods between 6 a.m. on the 2nd of April and 20 minutes before 9 a.m. of the same day, at which time the barometer ran down, it might be fairly inferred that the balloon had now, at 4 o'clock in the morning of April the 7th, reached a height of not less, certainly, than 7,254 miles above the surface of the sea. This elevation may appear immense, but the estimate upon which it is calculated gave a result in all probability far inferior to the truth. At all events, I undoubtedly beheld the whole of the Earth's major diameter. The entire northern hemisphere lay beneath me, like a chart, orthographically projected, and the great circle of the equator itself formed the boundary line of my horizon. Your Excellencies may, however, readily imagine that the confined regions hitherto unexplored within the limits of the Arctic Circle, although situated directly beneath me, and therefore seen without any appearance of being foreshortened, were still in themselves comparatively too diminutive, and at too great a distance from the point of sight to admit of any very accurate examination. Nevertheless, what could be seen was of a nature singular and exciting. Northwardly, from that huge rim before mentioned, and which, with slight qualification, may be called the limit of human discovery in these regions, one unbroken, or nearly unbroken, sheet of ice continues to extend. In the first few degrees of this its progress, its surface is very sensibly flattened, farther on depressed into a plain, and finally, becoming not a little concave, it terminates, at the pole itself, in a circular center, sharply defined, whose apparent diameter subtended at the balloon an angle of about sixty-five seconds, and whose dusky hue, varying in intensity, was at all times darker than any other spot upon the visible hemisphere, and occasionally deepened into the most absolute and impenetrable blackness. Farther than this, little could be ascertained. By twelve o'clock the circular center had materially decreased in circumference, and by seven p.m. I lost sight of it entirely the balloon passing over the western limb of the ice and floating away rapidly in the direction of the equator. April 8th. So it's an interesting view of the pole. Mm -hmm. Like something very mysterious. I yeah. Think. yeah. Found a sensible diminution in Earth's apparent diameter, besides a material alteration in its general color and appearance. The whole visible area partook in different degrees of a tint of pale yellow, and in some portions had acquired a brilliancy even painful to the eye. My view downward was also considerably impeded by the dense atmosphere in the vicinity of the surface being loaded with clouds, between whose masses I could only now and then obtain a glimpse of the earth itself. This difficulty of direct vision had troubled me more or less for the last forty-eight hours, but my present enormous elevation brought closer together, as it were, the floating bodies of vapor, and the inconvenience became, of course, more and more palpable in proportion to my ascent. Nevertheless, I could easily perceive that the balloon now hovered above the range of great lakes in the continent of North America, and was holding a course due south which would bring me to the tropics. This circumstance did not fail to give me the most heartful satisfaction, and I hailed it as a happy omen of ultimate success. Indeed, the direction I had hitherto taken had filled me with uneasiness, for it was evident that, had I continued it much longer, there would have been no possibility of my arriving at the moon at all, whose orbit is inclined to the elliptic at only the small angle of five degrees eight feet forty-eight inches. April 9th. 
Today the Earth's diameter was greatly diminished, and the color of the surface assumed hourly a deeper tint of yellow. The balloon kept steadily on her course to the southward and arrived at 9 p.m. over the northern edge of the Mexican Gulf. April 10th. I was suddenly aroused from slumber about five o'clock this morning by a loud crackling and terrific sound for which I could no manner account. It was of a very brief duration, but, while it lasted, resembled nothing in the world of which I had any previous experience. It is needless to say that I became excessively alarmed, having, in the first instance, attributed the noise to the bursting of the balloon. I examined all my apparatus, however, with great attention, and could discover nothing out of order. Spent a great part of the day in meditating upon an occurrence so extraordinary, but could find no means whatever of accounting for it. Went to bed dissatisfied and in a state of great anxiety and agitation. April 11th. Found a startling diminution in the apparent diameter of the earth, and a considerable increase now observable for the first time in that of the moon itself, which wanted only a few days of being full. It now required long and excessive labor to condense within the chamber sufficient atmospheric air for the sustenance of life. April 12th. A singular alteration took place in regard to the direction of the balloon, and although fully anticipated, afforded me the most unequivocal delight. Having reached, in its former course, about the twentieth parallel of southern latitude, it turned off suddenly, at an acute angle, to the eastward, and thus proceeded throughout the day, keeping nearly, if not altogether, in the exact plane of the lunar eclipse. What was worthy of remark, a very perceptible vacillation in the car, was a consequence of this change of route, a vacillation which prevailed, in more or less degree, for a period of many hours. April 13th. Was again very much alarmed by a repetition of the loud crackling noise which terrified me on the 10th. Thought long upon the subject, but was unable to form any satisfactory conclusion. Great decrease in the Earth's apparent diameter, which now subtended from the balloon at an angle of very little more than 25 degrees. The moon could not be seen at all, being nearly in my zenith. I still continued in the plane of the ellipse, but made little progress to the eastward. April 14th. Extremely rapid decrease in the diameter of the Earth. Today I became strongly impressed with the idea that the balloon was now actually running up the line of apsides to the point of perigee. In other words, holding the direct course which would bring it immediately to the moon in that part of its orbit the nearest to the Earth. The moon itself was directly overhead and consequently hidden from my view. Great and long continued labor necessary for the condensation of the atmosphere. April 15th. Not even the outlines of continents and seas could now be traced upon the earth with anything approaching distinctness. About twelve o'clock I became aware, for the third time, of that appalling sound which had so astonished me before. It now, however, continued for some moments, and gathered intensity as it continued. At length, while stupefied and terror-stricken, I stood in expectation of I knew not what hideous destruction— the car vibrated with excessive violence, and a gigantic and flaming mass of some material, which I could not distinguish, came with a voice of a thousand thunders roaring and booming by the balloon. When my fears and astonishment had in some degree subsided, I had little difficulty in supposing it to be some mighty volcanic fragment ejected from that world to which I was so rapidly approaching, and in all probability one of that singular class of substances occasionally picked up on the earth, and termed meteoric stones, for want of a better appellation. Mm. April 16th. Today, looking upward as well as I could, through each of the side windows alternately, I beheld, to my great delight, a very small portion of the moon's disk protruding, as it were, on all sides beyond the huge circumference of the balloon. My agitation was extreme for I had now little doubt of soon reaching the end of my perilous voyage. Indeed, the labor now required by the condenser had increased to a most oppressive degree, and allowed me scarcely any respite from exertion. Sleep was a matter nearly out of the question. I became quite ill, and my frame trembled with exhaustion. It was impossible that human nature could endure this state of intense suffering much longer." During the now brief interval of darkness, a meteoric stone again passed in my vicinity, and the frequency of these phenomena began to occasion me much apprehension. April 17. This morning proves an epoch in my voyage. It will be remembered that, on the 13th, the earth subtended at an angular breadth of 25 degrees. On the 14th, this had greatly diminished. On the 15th, 
a still more remarkable decrease was observable, and on retiring on the night of the 16th, I had noticed an angle of no more than about seven degrees and fifteen minutes. What, therefore, must have been my amazement on awakening from a brief and disturbed slumber on the morning of this day, the 17th, at finding the surface beneath me so suddenly and wonderfully augmented in volume as to subtend no less than 39 degrees in apparent angular diameter. I was thunderstruck. No words can give any adequate idea of the extreme, the absolute horror and astonishment with which I was seized, possessed, and altogether overwhelmed. My knees tottered beneath me, my teeth chattered, my hair started up on end. The balloon, then, had actually burst. These were the first tumultuous ideas that hurried through my mind. The balloon had positively burst. I was falling, falling with the most impetuous, the most unparalleled velocity. To judge by the immense distance already so quickly passed over, it could not be more than ten minutes, at the farthest, before I should meet the surface of the earth and be hurled into annihilation. But at length, reflection... <clears throat> Annihilation. Um, that's an interesting moment. That Well, first, my favorite entry was that April 16th one when it says, Today, looking upwards as well as I could through each of the side windows alternative, alternately, I beheld to my great delight a very small portion of the moon's disk protruding, as it were, on all sides beyond the huge circumference of the balloon. That that looking up and then seeing your destination but it's still obscured to you by your vehicle basically yeah there's something so like ominous and like uh, kind of i'd like to see arthur c or not arthur c clark um who's the guy who kubrick mm-hmm. like shoot that part and then yeah yeah there's something interesting about this object that's been in your life since birth the the moon all of a sudden having a vastly different size yeah because the first time that anyone in this story has ever been that close so quickly passed over it could not be more than 10 minutes at the farthest before i should meet the surface of the earth and be hurled into annihilation but at length reflection came to my relief i paused i considered and i began to doubt the matter was impossible i could not in any reason have so rapidly come down besides Although I was evidently approaching the surface below me, it was with a speed by no means commensurate with the velocity I had at first so horribly conceived. This consideration served to calm the perturbation of my mind, and I finally succeeded in regarding the phenomenon in its proper point of view. In fact, amazement must have fairly deprived me of my senses when I could not see the vast difference in appearance between the surface below me and the surface of my mother earth. The ladder was indeed over my head and completely hidden by the balloon. Right. And so basically what happened, just to to restate, is he wakes up and sees what he thinks is the earth beneath him way closer than he was expecting because it was sort of receding. And then basically it's just the balloon has changed uh, orientation and is now facing the moon. So he sees the moon beneath him. It's a nice touch. Well, the moon... The moon itself, in all its glory, lay beneath me and at my feet. I like... The stupor and surprise produced in my mind by this extraordinary... That moment, that has such kind of poetic resonance that all of a sudden the moon is at his feet. Like, Mm -hmm. he's gone out and conquered space. He dominated it. It's like now below him for the taking, basically. The moon itself, in all its glory, lay beneath me and at my feet. The stupor and surprise produced in my mind by this extraordinary change in the posture of affairs was perhaps, after all, that part of the adventure least susceptible of explanation. For the bouleversement in itself was not only natural and inevitable, but had been long actually anticipated as a circumstance to be expected whenever I should arrive at that exact point of my voyage where the attraction of the planet should be superseded by the attraction of the satellite. Or more precisely where the gravitation of the balloon toward the Earth should be less powerful than its gravitation toward the moon. To be sure, I arose from a sound slumber, with all my senses in confusion, to the contemplation of a very startling phenomenon, and one which, although expected, was not expected at the moment. The revolution itself must, of course, have taken place in an easy and gradual manner, and it is by no means clear that, had I even been awake at the time of the occurrence, I should have been made aware of it by any internal evidence of an inversion, that is to say, by any inconvenience or disarrangement, either about my person or about my apparatus. 
It is almost needless to say that, upon coming to a due sense of my situation and emerging from the terror which had absorbed every faculty of my soul, my attention was, in the first place, wholly directed to the contemplation of the general physical appearance of the moon. It lay beneath me like a chart, and although I judged it to be still at no inconsiderable distance, the indentures of its surface were defined to my vision with a most striking and altogether unaccountable distinctness. The entire absence of ocean or sea, and indeed of any lake or river, or body of water whatsoever, struck me, at first glance, as the most extraordinary feature in its geological condition. Yet, strange to say, I beheld vast level regions of a character decidedly alluvial, although by far the greater portion of the hemisphere in sight was covered with innumerable volcanic mountains, conical in shape, and having more the appearance of artificial than of natural protuberance. The highest among them does not exceed three and three-quarter miles in perpendicular elevation, but a map of the volcanic districts of the Campi Flagre would afford to your excellencies a better idea of their general surface than any unworthy description I might think proper to attempt. The greater part of them were in a state of evident eruption, and gave me fearfully to understand their fury and their power by the repeated thunders of the miscalled meteoric stones, which now rushed upward by the balloon with a frequency more and more appalling. That's a crazy image. There's super active volcanoes, which we know isn't true on on the moon, but they're sending out these space rocks, projectiles, mm -hmm. that keep zooming past the balloon. Yeah, uh, the clo it seems so still. I feel like in literature, the moon is considered this kind of still watcher in the darkness, but when he gets close to it, it's like this cacophony of boom, noise. Boom, yeah, boom, noise yeah. and activity, but even more than Earth. Right. Today I found an enormous increase in the moon's apparent bulk, and the evidently accelerated velocity of my descent began to fill me with alarm. It will be remembered that, in the earliest stage of my speculations upon the possibility of a passage to the moon, the existence, in its vicinity, of an atmosphere dense in proportion to the bulk of the planet had entered largely into my calculations. This, too, in spite of many theories to the contrary, and, it may be added, in spite of a general disbelief in the existence of any lunar atmosphere at all. But in addition to what I have already urged in regard to Anchor's Comet and the zodiacal light, I had been strengthened in my opinions by certain observations of Mr. Schroeder of Lilienthal. He observed the moon when two days and a half old, in the evening soon after sunset, before the dark part was visible, and continued to watch it until it became visible the two cusps appearing, tapering in a very sharp, faint prolongation, each exhibiting its farthest extremity faintly illuminated by the solar rays before any part of the dark hemisphere was visible. Soon afterward, the whole dark limb became illuminated. This prolongation of the cusps beyond the semicircle, I thought, must have arisen from the refraction of the sun's rays by the moon's atmosphere. I computed, also, the height of the atmosphere— which could refract light enough into its dark hemisphere to produce a twilight more luminous than the light reflected from the earth when the moon is about 32 degrees from the new, to be 1,356 Paris feet. In this view, I suppose the greatest height capable of refracting the solar ray to be 5,376 feet. My ideas on this topic had also received confirmation by a passage in the 82nd volume of the Philosophical Transactions in which it is stated that an occultation of Jupiter's satellites, the third disappeared after having been about one or two degrees of time indistinct, and the fourth became indiscernible near the limb. Cassini frequently observed Saturn, Jupiter, and the fixed stars, when approaching the moon to occultation, to have their circular figure changed into an oval one, and in other occultations he found no alteration of figure at all. Hence it might be supposed that at some times and not at others there is a dense matter encompassing the moon wherein the rays of the stars are refracted. Upon the resistance, or more properly, upon the support of an atmosphere existing in the state of density imagined, I had, of course, entirely depended for the safety of my ultimate descent. Should I then, after all, prove to have been mistaken, I had in consequence nothing better to expect, as a finale to my adventure, than being dashed into atoms against the rugged surface of the satellite. And, indeed, I had now every reason to be terrified. My distance from the moon was comparatively trifling, while the labor required by the condenser was diminished not at all, and I could discover no indication whatever of a decreasing rarity in the air. April 19th. This morning, to my great joy, about nine o'clock, 
the surface of the moon being frightfully near, and my apprehensions excited to the utmost, the pump of my condenser at length gave evident tokens of an alteration in the atmosphere. By ten, I had reason to believe its density considerably increased. By eleven, very little labor was necessary at the apparatus, and at twelve o'clock, with some hesitation, I ventured to unscrew the tourniquets. When, finding no inconvenience from having done so, I finally threw open the gum-elastic chamber and unrigged it from around the car. As might have been expected, spasms and violent headache were the immediate consequences of an experiment so precipitate and full of danger. But these and other difficulties attending respiration, as they were by no means so great as to put me in peril of my life, I determined to endure as best I could. In consider- It's like a sort of rebirth, almost, in yeah. the atmosphere of the moon. Mm-hmm. But these and other difficulties attending respiration, as they were by no means so great as to put me in peril of my life, I determined to endure as best I could, in consideration of my leaving them behind me momently in my approach to the denser strata near the moon. This approach, however, was still impetuous in the extreme, and it soon became alarmingly certain that, although I had probably not been deceived in the expectation of an atmosphere dense in proportion to the mass of the satellite, still I had been wrong in supposing this density, even at the surface, at all adequate to the support of the great weight contained in the car of my balloon. Yet this should have been the case, and in equal degree as at the surface of the earth. The actual gravity of bodies at either planet supposed in the ratio of the atmospheric condensation. That it was not the case, however, my precipitous downfall gave testimony enough. Why it was not so can only be explained by a reference to those possible geological disturbances to which I have formerly alluded. At all events, I was now close upon the planet and coming down with the most terrible impetuosity. I lost not a moment, accordingly, in throwing overboard first my ballast, then my water kegs, then my condensing apparatus and gum elastic chamber, and finally every article within the car. But it was all to no purpose. I still fell with horrible rapidity, and was now not more than half a mile from the surface. As a last resource, therefore, having got rid of my coat, hat, and boots, I cut loose from the balloon the car itself, which was of no inconsiderable weight, and thus, clinging with both hands to the network, I had barely time to observe that the whole country, as far as the eye could reach, was thickly interspersed with diminutive habitations. Ere I tumbled headlong into the very heart of a fantastical-looking city, and into the middle of a vast crowd of ugly little people, who none of them uttered a single syllable, or gave themselves the least trouble to render me assistance, but stood, like a parcel of idiots, grinning in a ludicrous manner, and eyeing me and my balloon askant, with their arms set akimbo. Okay. I turned from them and... So, this is incredible, that after... I don't know how many... On my edition, it's like 20 pages of detail on getting there. Right. The rapidity with which he shows up in what sounds like Times Square of the moon. Yeah. Not in the field somewhere, but like maybe at the center of their culture. Right. And that he had tra- he's traveled more than any other human being and immediately decides that they're idiots. Yeah. <laughs> not, not too dissimilar from the idiots he left on Earth, <laughs> which is such a nice touch for this kind of Don Quixote fool moron who's flying through space, who's... Even if you arrive on the moon, you're still the same person <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I love the description of arms being akimbo. What does that mean? Yeah, with hands on hi- on the hips and elbows turned outward. It's from Old Norsk. Yeah, well, they're, it's a northern planet, so. Yeah. City and into the middle of a vast crowd of ugly little people, who none of them uttered a single syllable or gave themselves the least trouble to render me assistance, but stood like a parcel of idiots, grinning in a ludicrous manner and eyeing me and my balloon askant, with their arms set akimbo. I turned from them in contempt, and gazing upward at the earth so lately left, and left perhaps forever, beheld it like a huge, dull copper shield, about two degrees in diameter, fixed immovably in the heavens overhead, and tipped on one of its edges with a crescent border of the most brilliant gold." No traces of land or water could be discovered, and the whole was clouded with variable spots and belted with tropical and equatorial zones. Thus, may it please your excellencies, after a series of great anxieties, unheard of dangers, and unparalleled escapes, I had, at length, on the nineteenth day of my departure from Rotterdam, arrived in safety at the conclusion of a voyage undoubtedly the most extraordinary and the most momentous ever accomplished, undertaken, or conceived by any denizen of Earth. 
but my adventures yet remain to be related. And indeed, your excellencies may well imagine that, after a residence of five oh, years wait, upon a planet that. not only deeply interesting in its... I like that it's subtle, but he... He's when he's explaining like how incredible his journey is. He compares himself to the uh, denizens of Earth, as mm. if he is no longer that person. Yeah, yeah. this is the end of the voyage, and he's considering himself no longer an Earthling. Basically, yeah, see you, Earthling. Yeah, but someone who's like transcended that that form of uh, uh, identity. He's like Elon Musk now. Yeah, exactly. But my adventures yet remain to be related. And indeed, your excellencies may well imagine that, after a residence of five years upon a planet not only deeply interesting in its own peculiar character, but rendered doubly so by its intimate connection in capacity of satellite with a world inhabited by man, I may have intelligence for the private ear of the State's College of Astronomers of far more importance than the details, however wonderful, of the mere voyage which so happily concluded. So, yeah, he's given you the details of the voyage, but he's holding for... Um well, he's going to be bargaining the details of the moon itself. Incredibly bold way to end a story. Yeah. I mean, inc- like, he gives you three sentences, and there's in the following paragraph, there's like, there's about half a paragraph worth of information of like, here's some rapid fire. He's giving you like, like a PowerPoint presentation of what this new civilization is like. And then just being like, all right, that's the end of the story. It's I, I loved it reading that because it's like, when the hell is he going to get to that moon? Mm-hmm. And then he's like, I was there anyways. We can talk about that later. <laughs> but first, yeah, and then here's w- what his uh, conditions are. This is, in fact, the case. I have much, very much, which it would give me the greatest pleasure to communicate. I have much to say of the climate of the planet, of its wonderful alternations of heat and cold, of unmitigated and burning sunshine for one fortnight, and more than polar frigidity for the next, of a constant transfer of moisture, by distillation like that in vacuo, from the point beneath the sun to the point the farthest from it, of a variable zone of running water, of the people themselves, of their manners, customs, and political institutions, of their peculiar physical construction, of their ugliness, of their want of years, those useless appendages in an atmosphere so peculiarly modified, of their consequent ignorance of the use and properties of speech, of their substitute for speech in a singular method of intercommunication, of the incomprehensible connection between each particular individual in the moon with some particular individual on the earth, a connection analogous with, and depending upon, that of the orbs of the planet and the satellites, and by means of which the lives and destinies of the inhabitants of the one are interwoven with the lives and destinies of the inhabitants of the other. And above all, if it so please your excellencies, above all of those dark and hideous mysteries which lie in the outer regions of the moon, regions which, owing to the almost miraculous accordance of the satellite's rotation on its own axis with its sidereal revolution about the earth, have never yet been turned, and, by God's mercy, never shall be turned to the scrutiny of the telescopes of man. All this, and more, much more, would I most willingly detail. But, to be brief, I must have my reward. I am pining for a return to my family and to my home, and as the price of any farther communication on my part, in consideration of the light which I have it in my power to throw upon many very important branches of physical and metaphysical science, I must solicit, through the influence of your honorable body, a pardon for the crime of which I have been guilty with the death of the creditors upon my departure from Rotterdam. This, then, is the object of the present paper. Its bearer, an inhabitant of the moon, whom I prevailed upon and properly instructed to be my messenger to the earth, will await your excellency's pleasure, and return to me with a pardon in question, if it can, in any manner, be obtained. I have the honor to be, etc., your excellency's very humble servant, Hans Fall. Yeah, so right there it introduces the idea that this is all basically a ruse. <laughs> To get uh, get him off of uh, murdering his creditors. I mean, it's almost like you would expect the final paragraph to be that he just is like hiding out in like the black forest somewhere in like the German city state. Yeah, you know, like that. He's like, how the, like he accidentally killed three of his creditors. And he's like, all right, how the fuck? or intentionally. Yeah, it's like, how am I going to get out of this? And he goes, I'll, I'll tell them I, I was went at the, to moon. the moon. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and he just like hires this like deformed person. Yeah. Well, let's see if the um, the uh, von Underduke and uh, Rubadub, the head of this uh, science society, let's see how they react to this letter. 
Upon finishing the perusal of this very extraordinary document, Professor Rubadub, it is said, dropped his pipe upon the ground in the extremity of his surprise, and my mere superb as von Underduck, having taken off his spectacles, wiped them, and deposited them in his pocket, so far forgot both himself and his dignity as to turn around three times upon his heel in the quintessence of astonishment and admiration. There was no doubt about the matter. The pardon should be obtained. So at least <laughs> swore with a round oath Professor Rubadub, and so finally thought the illustrious von Underduck, as he took the arm of his brother in science, and without saying a word, began to make the best of his way home to deliberate upon the measures to be adopted. Having reached the door, however, of the burgomaster's dwelling, the professor ventured to suggest that as the messenger had thought proper to disappear, no doubt frightened to death by the savage appearance of the burghers of Rotterdam, the pardon would be of little use, as no one but a man of the moon would undertake a voyage to so fast a distance. To the truth of this observation the burgomaster assented, and the matter was therefore at an end. Not so, however, rumors and speculations. The letter, having been published, gave rise to a variety of gossip and opinion. Some of the overwise even made themselves ridiculous by decrying the whole business as nothing better than a hoax. But hoax... Mm -hmm. With these sort of people is, I believe, a general term for all matters above their comprehension. For my part, I cannot conceive upon what data they have founded such an accusation. Let us see what they say. In primus, that certain wags in Rotterdam have certain special antipathies to certain burgomasters and astronomers. Haters. Yeah. Don't understand at all. Secondly, that an odd little dwarf and bottle conjurer both of whose certain mm. burgomasters and astronomers don't understand at all. What? What she Secondly, mean? that an odd little dwarf and bottle conjurer, both of whose ears for some misdemeanor have been cut off close to his head, has been missing for several days from the neighboring city of Bruges. <laughs> well, what of that? Thirdly, that the newspapers which were stuck all over the little balloon were newspapers of Holland, and therefore could not have been made in the moon. They were dirty papers. Very dirty. And Gluck the printer would take his Bible oath to their having been printed in Rotterdam. He was mistaken. Undoubtedly. Mistaken. Fourthly, that Hans Fall himself, the drunken villain, and the three very idle gentlemen styled his creditors, were all seen, no longer than two or three days ago, in a tippling house in the suburbs, having just returned, with money in their pockets, from a trip beyond the sea. Don't believe it. Don't believe a word of it. Lastly... That it is an opinion very generally received, or which ought to be generally received, that the College of Astronomers in the city of Rotterdam, as well as other colleges in all other parts of the world, not to mention colleges and astronomers in general, are, to say the least of the matter, not a whit better, nor greater, nor wiser than they ought to be. And that's the end of the Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall. Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, it does look like it was a ho the, the thing about that is it seems to perfectly predict the Great Moon hoax in, yeah. a, in a way that I don't understand why Poe just didn't say that. Like my satire w within weeks uh, predicted what this penny press was going to be able to do to society. Maybe he wasn't that conscious of this that being his symbolism, but he should have just t taken it as a called shot as opposed to like comparing his and trying to make his look like a hoax. Uh, like the Great Moon hoax. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because the my on my first reading, I was just I thought it was kind of a strange ending, but it was just like, oh, here's a pos here's like how people are able to rationalize it. But I kind of kept it firmly in my head that this definitely did happen. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's like any other event, like uh, the JFK assassination, or when, if you look closely at it, you realize how bizarre any event on earth actually is there's just like you know like people opening an umbrella at random times and right. stuff like that and I, I thought that was kind of my first reading was like this just an example of like even if someone comes back with an alien you can still be like well yeah exactly <laughs> there's many explanations for this and but in that kind of greater context it's even more of like a it's even more bizarre that. Because the real story appears to be that they kidnapped a dwarf and yeah. put him in a balloon and made him pretend to be an alien yeah. <laughs> to try to get Hans Fall off of either murdering his creditors or somehow... Or they all fake their own death. Maybe they all fake their get deaths together and what happened there then. Maybe yeah. 
like maybe his descriptions of using them for their labor and then blowing them up maybe that was just to throw people off their trail too yeah yeah i mean it would it there's hints of it then with his like his uh easy ability to like kill those cats basically yeah to be like yeah whatever or the like the pigeons and the pigeons yeah, yeah. and literally the creditor well yeah i guess maybe we, we, we if we don't yeah, know guess, what's yeah. true yeah it's a real kaiser soze situation all right so let's um let's go into this uh if you will alex um this is uh from the great courses how great science fiction works professor gary k wolf this is one of the better great courses that i've uh listened to and we're i'll just listen to this first like uh nine minutes or so on uh, where sort of Poe and this story in particular fit in in terms of like the history of, of science fiction. Cause you know, there's Mary Shelley. Um, there's certain things prior to this, but um, I guess the, some people place Poe's more than Shelley's. And I think they might be wrong, but because Shelley's more of a monster Gothic romance, and this is more of a, uh, like a more scientific, but anyway, here's the, Here's Professor Gary K. Wolf talking about it. Lecture 2. Science Fiction in the 19th Century. There are a lot of ways that we can date the beginning of science fiction. Stories of trips to the moon dating from classical antiquity, the beginning of scientific thinking with the Enlightenment, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with its more or less scientifically created creature, or even the pulp magazines that gave the field its first clearly defined market for writers and readers. But another way of asking the question is when did science fiction think it began? If, as many readers and fans feel, the science fiction field has been engaged in this long, grand dialogue about the role of science in society and even our place in the universe, when did that dialogue begin? And can we trace a continuous line of influences down to the present? Now, certainly Mary Shelley's Frankenstein never left the popular consciousness from the moment it was published. But if we think about science fiction as a self-aware kind of writing with a defined readership, the sort of thing that enables a writer to think, if I write this kind of fiction, I can sell it to that magazine or that publisher, then there's a case to be made for those pulp magazines. The first of those magazines, devoted to science fiction, at least in the United States, was edited by an immigrant from Luxembourg named Hugo Gernsback, who had had some earlier success publishing science fiction in hobbyist magazines devoted to radio and electronics. It was called Amazing Stories, and its very first issue was published in April of 1926. In honor of Gernsback's accomplishment in providing the first clearly defined market for science fiction stories, science fiction fans would later name the field's most famous award, given out every year at the World Science Fiction Convention, the Hugo Award. Hmm. And all we need to do to get a sense of what Gernsback felt was the beginning of the science fiction conversation is to look at the rather garish cover of that issue. Only three names appear, Edgar Allan Poe, Jules Verne, and H.G. Wells, each of whose fiction was reprinted in the issue. Now, those early issues of Amazing Stories included a lot of reprints, possibly because Gernsback felt a need to educate his readership regarding the kind of fiction he was promoting. But partly because, well... There weren't any science fiction writers yet in that sense of knowing about a market that I mentioned earlier. Gernsback didn't actually call this new kind of fiction science fiction, preferring instead a word he had just made up, scientifiction, a portmanteau of scientific and fiction that never really caught on, I think for good reasons. For one thing, no one really knew how to pronounce it. Is it scientifiction or scientific, whatever? But what's really important about that first issue are those three names, Poe, Verne, and Wells, because they give us an important clue as to what early 20th century science fiction writers, or what editors, saw as the emergence of the field in the 19th century. Now, I mean, it, leaving out Shelley is kind of, I mean, we're, we're a ma- basically Hugo making a canon, mm-hmm. right? And, I mean, if he would have just put Shelley's name on the front and reprinted Frankenstein, would our view of that be slightly different? Yeah, yeah. it's interesting that I really don't think of it as, like, science fiction. Even though Frankenstein? It, yeah. I've never read it. Oh, actually. really? Yeah. But there's so many, like, dialogues in that novel about philosophy and being not nearly as much about exploration or like the like descriptions of the material world that i think when i think of science fiction i think of that right 
editors, saw as the emergence of the field in the 19th century. And that's what I want to explore now. Although none of these authors would have thought of themselves as writing science fiction, it seems clear that 19th century fiction was the cauldron from which the 20th century science fiction story emerged. And each of these three writers contributed in particular ways to what would later be major modes of science fiction writing. Verne with the technological tale and the fabulous voyage, Wells with science fiction as social commentary or a mirror of the major issues of his own day, and, and Edgar Allan Poe with, well, with Poe, a number of things. When you think of the popular forms of modern fiction, the short story, the terror tale, the detective story, the science fiction story, it can be rather stunning to find that this one eccentric genius, one of the most colorful, disturbed, and disturbing figures in American literature, seems to have had a significant hand in the beginnings of just about all of them. Perhaps the first modern detective in fiction was Dupin from Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue and The Mystery of Marie Roget. And even today, the mystery writers of America named their annual awards the Edgars. And yet, the very nature of Poe's importance to all these fields is, is hard to pin down. He's cited as a formative influence by supernatural fiction writers, from H.P. Lovecraft to Stephen King and Peter Straub, and yet there's remarkably little supernatural content in most of Poe's fiction. His influence on science fiction is undeniable, yet there are few, if any, stories that depict scientists or the practice of science at all. Even Poe's contemporary, Nathaniel Hawthorne, wrote a story, Rappuccini's Daughter, in which an Italian scientist raises his daughter among poisonous plants until she herself becomes poisonous. But such mad <laughs> scientists are nowhere to be found in Poe, <laughs> unless you count the mesmerist or hypnotist in the facts of the case of Monsieur Valdemar, who hypnotizes a dying man and somehow keeps him in a state of suspended animation for months until he awakens, and the body immediate, immediately decays into a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putrescence. That, by the way, was among the first of a long list of stories that ended with rapid aging and decay when some spell is lifted, including H. Ryder Haggard's, Haggard's adventure novel, She, and Oscar Wilde's famous The Picture of Dorian Gray. Mm. What's probably more revealing about this story, though, is that Poe originally published it without telling anyone it was fiction, so that many readers took it as a straight journalistic account. Now, Poe was fascinated by hoaxes, and in the view of some critics, this is crucial to his relationship to science fiction, stories that are at least by the popular understanding of the day, at least they could be read as something that might very well have been possible. Now, another of Poe's stories was the unparalleled adventure of one Hans Fall, which appeared in 1835 and described the title character's trip to the moon. Now, this is often regarded as one of Poe's lesser works, but the British science fiction writer and critic Adam Roberts makes a persuasive case for its importance as early science fiction. This story begins... In Rotterdam, when a bizarre-looking dwarf descends in a balloon, apparently made of newspapers, drops a manuscript, and flies away again. The manuscript tells how its author, a local bellows mender named Hans Fall, decides to escape his creditors by constructing a balloon that will transport him to the moon, where he lands in the very heart of a fantastical-looking city and into the middle of a vast crowd of ugly little people. Fall then ends his tale, promising to reveal more wonders of the moon later, but only if he is pardoned for the crime of murdering his creditors who were killed in an unexpected explosion when his balloon was originally launched. At the very end of the story, some bits of evidence are suggested that the whole manuscript is a hoax. And Adam Roberts might be right in suggesting that the hoax ending has caused some critics to dismiss the story as a trifle. But when we look at the details of Hans Fall's account we see that they're worked out with as much scientific precision as was available to Edgar Allan Poe in 1835. For buoyancy, he discovers a secret gas whose density is about 37.4 times less than that of hydrogen. He, estimate the distance, he estimates the distance to the moon as 237,000 miles, which is pretty accurate, and he calculates how long his trip will take at his average speed. He worries about the loss of atmospheric pressure at high altitudes, and he invents an unlikely device to condense air out of the near vacuum of space. He cites the research of actual scientists like Joseph Guy Lussac and Giovanni Cassini, and even conducts experiments with pigeons and a cat he's brought along. And perhaps most remarkably, 
He provides vivid descriptions of the curved surface of the Earth as it appears from various altitudes, descriptions that have turned out to be surprisingly accurate. So, hoax or not, Poe, in the guise of Hans Fall, had thought through a moon trip with all the discipline of a modern writer of hard science fiction. Now, and just to just to re, uh, reiterate that it wasn't Poe didn't consider it a hoax until after the success of the Great Moon Hoax. But um, right. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to say before we sign off, Alex? Mm, yeah, it's a very, it's, I don't know. It's hard to, uh, you can see reading Poe, reading this one in particular, the early seeds of a lot of things that are going to be popular in American literature. Mm-hmm. I think if only, I mean, not just the genres that the professor pointed out, but this idea of the, um, the uh, newspaper man at turn writer is going to be an extremely popular <laughs> uh, mode of uh, uh, American storytelling. Reading Hawthorne sometimes like it's, it's quite good, but it's, it feels much more removed from uh, 2019 America than uh, Poe's, even though there's so many anachronistic ideas, you know, about space and things like that, the, the point of view and the idea and the ideas he's conveying, feel very current or part of the same ecosystem yeah and and that's what's so interesting is the economic pressures of this sort of this genre of writing like he would actually write a a hoax intentional hoax later in 1844 mm-hmm. because you need to you need to sell um you need to sell papers basically um i mean it's like the click you need the clicks ba- yeah basically. basically um where He's is pivoting to hoaxes yeah, exactly. It's like the pivot to video. Mm-hmm. Um, this is again from Carlo Martinez's uh, E.A. Poe's Hans Fall, the Penny Press, and the Autonomy of the Literary Field. He's talking about a different. He's talking. This is basically in um, letters to uh, letters to editors and things like this. He's talking about one of his earlier stories that came out in the um, the same uh, journal that Hans Fall did called Berenice where he agrees that it uh, approaches the very verge of bad taste, but adds that questions of taste are little to the purpose. To be appreciated, you must be read, and these things are invariably sought after with avidity. Uh, And then uh, later he says, the effect, if any, will be estimated better by the circulation of the magazine than by any comments upon the contents. And it reminded me of... uh, He talked about... um, He he boasts about leaving the... uh, Southern Literary Messenger, which is where Hans Fall was published. When he started there, it had 700 subscribers, and when it left, it had 5,500. Right. Which, it, it makes me think of how, um, when I worked at uh, Full Fact in London, how, like, a big thing was, oh, we had 300 followers at the beginning of the summer, but now we're up to, like, 1,200. Yeah, yeah. And, like, crushing it, um, basically. Yeah. Oh, I Regardless mean, of the content. By the way, I think it's Poe's point. Right. Uh, Speaking of which, we just crossed a hundred and we are at a hundred and fifty patrons right now. By the way. Oh, nice. So, Patreon dot com slash Literary Hangover. If you want to uh, support this show, support our uh, this is this is the most epic uh, recording session we've done so far. Uh, We're going to play out with uh, with some Jules Verne. That mentions uh, from the Earth to the Moon, but it was 1865, I believe. Hmm. Um, it's about a. Uh, well, have maybe check that. Yeah, with this extra long literary hangover, you can get uh, extra drunk on Friday night. So <laughs> if it takes you twice as long to get over your hangover, because you'll be in good company for a while. Yeah, so 1865, basically post American Civil War at the Baltimore Gun Club. All right. Um, this guy, um, basically, how they get to the moon is just fire people at it like in a bullet. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I remember that. I was hoping just fire like f- like fire handguns on the ground until you get lifted up into the moon. The NRA would probably prefer that because you could sell a lot more ammunition. Yeah, it's a lot of bullets. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so this is also from Librivox uh, reader, um, and uh, this is Jules Verne going through the history of in uh, having a character, I guess, go through the history of of the imagination of moon exploration, and then he gets to uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, 
before we go, thank you very much, Alex, for joining me this evening. Oh, of course. We made it to the moon and back. We, or we did really we? did. Or, yeah, or is this all a con? Who knows? Um, you should, you should uh, just not go to work for the next two days and edit in, like, moon, so- like, space sound effects throughout the entire episode. As if I went to space? Yeah, just like we're, like we're on a journey to the moon the entire time. <laughs> All right. So here is, this is from chapter two, the uh, President Barbicane's communication. He's got a message for the gun club. Um, this is very... Like all great moments of science <laughs> start by a, pre- a preface to the folks at the gun club. I mean, that is a very interesting setting post-Civil War. Yeah. The gun club, the American gun club. Um, and here, here is President Barbican's address. We will see you next time, folks. Oh, and uh, thanks again, by the way, before we go. Um, catching up, January was a pretty crazy week. We had two live shows, one for Majority Report, one for Michael Brooks' show. Got a little bit behind on some stuff, but uh, we're back in, uh, back in the saddle and uh, should be normal from here. Smooth ride from here on out. Anyway, here's Jules Verne. Permit me, he continued, to recount to you briefly how certain ardent spirits, starting on imaginary journeys, have penetrated the secrets of our satellite. In the 17th century, a certain David Fabricus boasted of having seen, with his own eyes, the inhabitants of the moon. In 1649, a Frenchman, one Jean Baboon, published a journey performed from the earth to the moon by Domingo Gonzalez, a Spanish adventurer. At the same period, Cyrano de Bergiac published that celebrated Journeys to the Moon, which met with such success in France. Somewhat later, another Frenchman named Fontelet wrote The Plurality of Worlds, a Fête de Roi of its time. About 1835, a small treatise translated from the New York American related how Sir John Herschel, having been dispatched to the Cape of Good Hope for the purpose of making there some astronomical calculations, had, by means of a telescope, wrought to perfection by means of internal lighting, reduced the apparent distance of the moon to 80 yards. He then distinctly perceived caverns, frequented by hippopotami, green mountains bordered by golden lacework, sheep with horns of ivory, a white species of deer, and inhabitants with membranous wings like bats. This brochure, the work of an American named Locke, had a great sale, but to bring this rapid sketch to a close, I will only add that a Captain Hans Pfahl of Rotterdam launched himself in a balloon filled with a gas extracted from nitrogen, 37 times lighter than hydrogen, reaching the moon after a passage of 19 hours. This journey, like all previous ones, was purely imaginary. Still, it was the work of a popular American author, I mean Edgar Poe. Cheers for Edgar Poe, roared the assemblage, electrified by their president's words. I have now enumerated, said Barbicane, the experiments which I call purely Edgar Poe. Cheers for Edgar Poe, roared the assemblage, electrified by their president's words. I have now enumerated, said Barbicane, the experiments which I call purely paper ones, and wholly insufficient to establish serious relations with the Queen of the Night. Nevertheless, I am bound to add that some practical genius